Madam Chair, if we can start over with your mic on. Thank you. It's been a long afternoon. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And I call this meeting to order. Um, April 25th, 2023 hybrid administrative meeting of the Board of County Commissioners. We will have a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, which I will lead. Thank you all. Please stand. Thank you all. Um, before we proceed, I would like to read the following closed meeting statements into the record. Um, the following statement regarding a closed litigation meeting held today, Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. The only matters discussed during the closed session were those items described on the published notice and agenda for the meeting held today, April 25th, 2023. I need a motion for approval of this statement and it will become part of the minutes of this meeting. Motion for approval. And that's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, and that is approved. Um, a closed meeting statement number two. I move that the Bernalillo County Attorney and County Manager be authorized to proceed with the matters discussed in the closed meeting held on Tuesday, April 25th, 2023, within the parameters set by this commission to include possible purchase and or condemnation proceedings and preliminary right of way, right of entry for North Rio Bravo pond site. I need a motion, motion to approve. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Great. Uh, item three on our agenda, Madam County Manager, are there any changes to the agenda? A good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and Commissioners. So, yes, we've got four. So, first one is item 3A, National Small Business Week Proclamation, uh, to be added to the agenda as item 4C under proclamations. Uh, the second is item 7E, UNMH Board of Trustees reappointments to be deferred to the May 9th meeting. Uh, the next one is item 9C. The Public Safety Division opioid funding, uh, we would uh, request for that to be deferred to a future meeting. And then lastly, item 10A, the Metropolitan Detention Center Health Authority Joint Powers Agreement, if that could be moved up to the agenda uh, to be heard immediately following item 5B. And Madam Chair, a vote is required for the changes requested. Thank you. Thank you. County Manager. Um, I'd like to ask for any additional changes from the board before we go to a vote. Madam Chair? Uh, Commissioner Olivas. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to ask that items 7F, 7I, and 7J be removed from the con consent agenda. Thank you. So uh, with those requested changes, I move approval of the agenda as amended. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And that passes. Uh, before we go to proclamations, we will have a Bernalillo County Count on Us Minute presentation. Um, is there a, sure. um, Madam Chair and Commissioners, so we're starting something a little bit new tonight. Um, so I think that everybody really should have, it's so nice to get good news, especially at the, in the beginning of, of a, one of our meetings. So this is sort of a new tradition uh, that um, I'd like to begin tonight. So uh, Burn Co. has a lot of it, and we're going to periodically be sharing more of these good things with you by highlighting employees and initiatives that make a difference in our community. So in tonight's uh, Count on Us Minute, that's what it's called, you'll meet Burn Co. employee Charles Griego and, and learn about what he did recently to make a difference at our county-run, uh, excuse me, wellness hotel. So, go ahead. Thank you.
Joe, uh, my rank is a sergeant uh, at Metropolitan Detention Center, but I currently am working with public safety at the Winter Wellness Center. So Charles and team are working at our wellness hotel, which basically provides shelter for families in the Albuquerque area in Bernalillo County. Um, currently, we have 24 room here. Chain is, my name is Charles Grego. Uh, my rank is a sergeant uh, at Metropolitan Detention Center, but I currently am working with public safety at the Winter Wellness Center. So Charles and team are working at our wellness hotel, which basically provides shelter for families in the Albuquerque area in Bernalillo County. Um, currently, we have 24 rooms that are occupied by single moms with kids, single dads with kids, or joint families. My job normally does not entail doing first responder things like that, but I was sitting here in the office, went outside, heard a scream, uh, saw a lady running down the stairs, yelling that her child needed help, asked her what was going on, saw that she had several gashes on her, one on her knee and one on her chest, put, got some towels, had her put pressure on the chest and the knee of the ch child to, to stop the blood flow. We couldn't be more proud of Charles Griego and his fast reaction to the situation at hand. The mother was frantic, and Charles knew exactly what needed to be done at the time of need. And that's because you can count on us as Bernalillo County employees. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Chief, um, with that little small hiccup, that was really great. So go ahead. And <laughs> Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, uh, always great to be able to, to capture the, the success of one of our employees. And Charles has been helping out at our wellness hotel, and this was one of those incidents where he knew exactly what to do at the right time. So, Charles, I don't know if you want to share just a bit with the, with the Commissioners. I uh, just want to say thank you. Uh, it's awesome to get recognition like this uh, from you guys and from my boss. So that's all I really can say is thank you. I appreciate it. I'm very humbled. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for you. your work. Yes. Thank you. So now we'll move on to item four, proclamations, uh, 4A, Vice Chair Barboa. Thank you. This first proclamation um, recognizes today, this month as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, as somebody who's worked my lifetime with women and um, our queer community, and as a survivor of sexual assault, I um, I think it's so important that we always um, bring awareness, that we always try to make sure we're not in the shadows and that people feel that sharing their story can empower and um, bring people out of isolation who might be feeling um, the impacts of sexual assault. So the Bernalillo County Board of Commissioners, whereas April is nationally recognized as Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and whereas statistics on sexual assault indicate that more than one in four of us experience sexual abuse, assault, or rape in our lifetime, meaning survivors of sexual assault exist in every neighborhood, every family, and every level of government. And when the survivors of sexual assault share their stories, they display a level of courage and concern for their community that is an example for every person. And whereas there is compelling evidence that this can be, uh, that we can be successful in reducing sexual violence through prevention, education, increased awareness, and holding perpetrators who commit acts of violence responsible for their actions. And whereas anyone can be a leader in preventing and ending sexual violence. As employers, educators, parents, and friends, we all have an obligation to uphold these, the basic principle that every individual should be free from violence and fear. And whereas the theme for Sexual Assault and Awareness, Awareness Month in 2023 is drawing connections, preventing demands equity. Prevention demands equity. Recognizing that systems of oppression such, such as racism, sexism, classism, heterosexualism, ageism, and ableism contribute to higher sexual harassment, assault, and abuse rates. Drawing connections recognize that it takes ending all forms of oppression to end sexual violence. 
And whereas National Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Month calls attention to misconceptions and misinformation about sexual assault, and it is important that we continue to dedicate ourselves to creating a society where sexual assault is not tolerated, survivors are believed and supported, and all persons in our community can live without fear of sexual assault. And whereas Bernalillo County strongly supports the efforts of national, state, and local partners and every citizen to actively engage in public and private efforts to prevent sexual assault. It's time for all of us to start the conversation, take the appropriate action, and support one another to create a safer environment for all. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Bernalillo County Board of Commissioners does hereby pro proclaim the month of April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Thank you very much, Commissioner Barboa. Thank you. So we will move on to um, item 4B. Um, Commissioner Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Thompson, Ms. Ortega, would you mind coming up to the podium? Thank you. So this is in recognition of the uh, National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week, which is April 9th through the 15th, uh, which we did recognize at the time, but then uh, speaking with the county manager and Chief Pettis, um, felt like we needed to give, draw a little more attention to uh, the work that's actually being done. So uh, as far as the acknowledgement, emergency com Emergency communications is the vital link between the community and fire and rescue, police officers and emergency medical services, ensuring the quick response of emergency personnel to protect the public and ensuring emergency personnel receive continuing and correct information to maintain their safety. Effective communications with the public has remained even more critical now as systems become more technical with an increase of service calls yearly. Started by Contra Costa County Sheriff's Office in California in 1981, National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week is celebrated during the second week of April to honor public safety telecommunications personnel nationwide. The Bernalillo County Emergency Communications Department and its 911 operators exhibit compassion, understanding, and professionalism in each interaction with the public, leading to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and treatment of patients. During these trying times, the safety of our emergency responders is especially dependent upon the accuracy of information obtained from calls to our emergency communicators to protect law enforcement officers, firefighters, and paramedics responding to possible encounters with service calls that contain a need for scene safety. The Board of County Commissioners thus acknowledges April 9th through 15th, 2023 as National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week and extends gratitude on behalf of the community for the dedication of the Bernalillo County Emergency Communications Department staff. And I'd like to give you a, a minute to talk, but I just wanted to um, uh, just tell everybody here that that these folks are the first first responders, and um, uh, our call center is actually in District Four, and I drive by it every day, taking our kids to school. So, so I think about you guys a lot, and I've been able to sit in on some of those calls, and uh, if you have a, a weak stomach or a weak heart. I wouldn't recommend uh, sitting in on these calls. Uh, they're nerve-wracking, to say the least. And um, uh, in fact, Bernalillo County covers for the city of Albuquerque, uh, I believe, five times in the last two weeks. Is that right, Ms. Thompson? Uh, Commissioner Benson, seven. Seven times in the last two weeks. So the city of Albuquerque is 911. Uh, system goes down and we cover for them and, and the last time and you can correct me again if I'm wrong but last time was last night for uh, five hours seven hours and uh, how many hundreds of calls did you take over uh, Commissioner Benson over five and a half hours three different outages 400 911 calls that included Albuquerque's uh, police department okay. and fire department. So over 400 911 calls in a stretch of time. And Ms. Ortega, I'll let you speak to this, but you had a first. 
which is a was a heartbreaking uh, phone call to respond to, but um, with a with hopefully a happy ending, and um, and and you've been here for fourteen years, yes. which uh, we're grateful for. Thank so, you. with that, um, we just want to say thank you, and and we know that you represent the whole department. So please pass pass this uh, um, praise and recognition on to the entire department. But yeah, uh, do you have any words? Madam Chair, Commissioners, thank you for the recognition. I'm Vernon Lee Thompson, Emergency Communications Director. Everyone calls me Lee. If you don't, you're going to make my mother mad. Mm -hmm. So please just call me Lee when you see me. I have Crystal Ortega to my right. She's my Quality Assurance Specialist. And what she does is keep all our 911 operators in compliance on 911 calls, which keeps us all out of trouble. So we do appreciate the recognition. And I do want her to talk about her call real quickly because she has been a operator for 14 years. You will find nobody finer in the United States as a dispatcher. I will guarantee you. So, Crystal. Thank you. Um, so normally I don't take calls. I was a dispatcher for 11 years. Now I'm the quality assurance specialist, like he said. So because we were down, I jumped on phones and started taking 911 calls. In the 14 years I've been there, this was the first time that I took a call where a 15-year-old female hung herself and her mother found her and was hysterical on the phone. After giving instructions for mouth-to-mouth -mouth and chest compressions, once the paramedics got on scene, they did get a pulse back and she was able to be transported. Thank you so much, Thank, Ms. thank, you. thank you for your thank you for your work. Thank you. And that's just I mean that this was her first call, but uh, they get they're they're the worst of the worst, the phone calls. The when the deputies arrive on scene, they arrive on scene because uh, 911 has been called first. If the fire department shows up or EMT because 911 has been called. So um, thank you for everything you do for helping keeping our citizens safe. God bless you all. Thank you. On the final proclamation, Commissioner Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, this is in recognition of the um, National Small Business Week, which is April 30th through May 6th. And uh, Marcos, thank you for coming down. Whereas America's strongest economy, sorry, whereas America's strongest economic growth in almost 40 years has been driven by the resilience of our own small businesses who despite a worldwide pandemic continue to pioneer innovative solutions to our country's greatest challenges and create opportunities for families and workers. And whereas small businesses remain the heartbeat of our communities and the American economy, employing more than half of our nation's workers, inventing and innovating to launch new technologies and create new American-led industries, enrich our main streets, making parts and products in America to fuel our supply chains and building our nation's infrastructure. And whereas historic investments made through the President's American Rescue Plan, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, CHIPS, and Science Act, and Inflation Reduction Act will ensure small businesses have access to federal capital support, technical assistance, contracting opportunities, and other resources to help lead the way as we rebuild America's roads and bridges and build a clean energy economy for the future. And whereas, when we support small businesses, jobs are created, and local communities preserve their unique culture. And whereas, entrepreneurship continues to be one of the best pathways to the American dream evidenced by the remarkable small business boom with more than 10.5 million Americans applying to start a business since January 20th, 2021, more than in any other two-year period in American history. And whereas, by renewing our commitment to supporting small businesses, we can maintain our global competitiveness and build a stronger nation where everyone can succeed from the bottom up and middle out. Whereas the President of the United States has proclaimed National Small Business Week every year since 1963 to highlight the programs and services available to entrepreneurs 
through the U.S. Small Business Administration and other government agencies, and whereas Bernalillo County supports and joins in this national effort to recognize the contributions of small business to the American economy and their importance in ensuring that our local communities remain as vibrant today and re remain as vibrant tomorrow as they are today. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Bernalillo County Board of Commissioners does hereby proclaim April 30th, May 6, 2023, as National Small Business Week, done this 25th day of April 2023 in Bernalillo County. Thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, Commissioner Benson, thank you so much for um, being able to share our excitement and recognizing the small business owners of Bernalillo County and that over 15,000 small businesses work every day to serve us here in Bernalillo County. So um, with that, I wanted to introduce Michelle uh, Duran with the SBA that can fill us all in about uh, the small Business Week celebrations that will be going on and how we can share with that. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Mr. Gonzalez and Ms. Uh, Tobias and Bernalillo County Economic Department uh, for helping the SBA. We are going to highlight next week, which is Small Business Week, which is, you know, as the part of the SBA, the Small Business Administration, it is our favorite week, right? So we got to share that. <laughs> Um, that is what we do. That is what our mission is, um, to help grow, start, and uh, recover if needed. And, of course, they needed us more than ever um, this last couple years. Um, just a quick note on Bernalillo County-specific numbers. Um, Bernalillo County, in fiscal year 2022, um, the SBA provided 160 million, over $160 million dollars to uh, Bernalillo County small businesses, which is great. Last year, 2021, we did um, almost 240 million because of the pandemic. So we're still out there helping small businesses, um, which is great. Um, over 50% of Americans own or work for a small business. Not us, right? But over 50, all the other 100, over 50% of Americans. Um, and these businesses create two out of three uh, new jobs in the U.S. every year. So small businesses are, are the heart of our economy. Um, and um, let's see. And the next part is that we have a celebration um, next Friday. Our SBA administrator will be in town. Um, they have chosen four cities to um, do a road, road uh, show tour. Um, and so next week, we will be celebrating uh, the SBA New Mexico National Small Business Week Award winners. We have 12 winners over 14 awards. And um, Mr. Gallegos and his department are going to help um, highlight our, small our New Mexico Small Business Person of the Year, who is Lynn Armijo for Wins Mechanical. She is a woman-owned business and a veteran-owned business. And she is going to be in Washington, D.C. Um, coming up this week to see if she is going to compete with the 50 other states in our territories for that award, which is going to be amazing. And so we're happy to have her representing New Mexico. Um, unfortunately, that event is invitation only and it is full. So maybe next year, you guys. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but we will be throwing a big ball and it will be amazing. Um, and then there is a two-day uh, summit that the Small Business Administration is having for all entrepreneurs and small businesses um, to help them uh, grow, give them uh, resources for federal, um, federal resources with other agencies and workshops. And so we'll get that um, promoted for all our New Mexico businesses. So thank you all for uh, helping us and supporting us. Thank you so much. And I just want to also mention, well, first of all, you've got a, um, two small business owners up here. Uh, uh, Commissioner Olivas and I are small business owners. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I believe, uh, speaking with uh, all the commissioners, we've all worked for small businesses. And I think probably everybody in this room has at one point or another. Either well. you have someone you know, you're thinking about it, you know, your sister, your grandma. Right. Or you have your favorite small businesses, you know, your favorite tacos place or whatever, right? Exactly. And the other thing, um, just to give recognition to Ms. Armijo, um, I since found out after she won the award 
that uh, her business is in uh, in District 4, so shout out there. But also, she's the sister of our own beloved Mei Ling Armijo. Um, so the apple doesn't fall far from the tree there. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for your support. Madam thank Chair. Thank you very much. Commissioner Kissinger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I'm also a small business owner. I'm 5'7". <laughs> yes, yes. And... I have one employee, that's me. Show your five yes. entrepreneur. <laughs> okay, I'm 5'7-ish. <laughs> I used to be 5'7". I'm 60 now, more-ish now. So she's right. But I'm also, you know, I think we leave, we leave out gig workers and people who, who are performers. Uh, that's a small business. It's not a large business. So, um, you know, we have to you know, jump through a lot of the hoops and, in order to survive and, and for us to perform. We perform for mostly small businesses, comedy clubs, you know, clubs, if you're in the music, you know, yes, kind of gig definitely. industry. And so uh, we're always hustling, trying to find a way in to, 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 to make a living. And uh, the only reason why I'm speaking up is because, you know, we, we were left out. Uh, when it came to COVID relief, gig workers were kind of left out. Um, and we didn't get any kind of really relief, uh, you know, along that. And so I know a lot of the bands and musicians and entertainers really suffered uh, during the pandemic. And so I just want to do a shout out to all those small businesses that I believe you're a small business and, and we want to support you and we'll find out ways to support gig workers. Yes, agreed. And uh, the New Mexico uh, Economic Department had, I believe, a grant for some film um, so for actors, and then also there are some uh, nonprofits uh, that do creative small businesses. So that would be, um, you know, performing, acting, arts, um, and we have tons of resources. So call us, you know, we're across the street. If you need help, we'll point you in the right direction and get you guys some resources or assistance on how to build your credit or how to find marketing, uh, how to get marketing training, all that good stuff. And, you know. We're here to help you guys. Anybody. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Madam Chair. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for those important proclamations and recognition. Um, we, we will move on to item five. Oh, yes. Oh, you want a picture? And presentation. Thank you all. So we will now move on to item five, which is uh, public comment and communications. So before we hear communication items 5A and 5B, we will, we will hear public comment. Um, for that comment, you will have two minutes to share your comments. You will then be notified when your time is up. For those participating via Zoom, you will be muted and moved to the waiting room. Should any of the commissioners have follow-up questions to your comments, you will have an opportunity to answer. Uh, Julianne, how many do we have signed up? And please um, proceed. Madam Chair, we have three speakers signed up. They're all in person. When I state your name, if you can make your way to the podium, starting with Don Schrader, followed by John Beltry, followed by Ramona Goolsby. The worst place on Earth for us to live is far better than the best place on Mars. None of our sun's other planets have good conditions for us to live. The next closest star after our sun is four light years away. Even if that star had a planet like our Earth, even if it were possible to travel at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, not per hour, not per minute, even if the spacecraft had enough food, air, and water for a round trip of eight years at best, who would be fool enough to be trapped in a spacecraft for eight years? Space exploration is science fiction insanity, as crazy as any religion. Space travel is a desperate delusion to escape this cruel, polluted world. Mother Earth is our only home in this very dark 
cold, lonely, vast universe. Space travel cannot bail us out of making huge changes now in how we live to slow the climate crisis. Living in big houses, driving or flying thousands of miles, trashes Mother Earth far more than homeless people with shopping carts and heaps of rubbish. Why waste brains, resources, and billions of dollars on space travel insanity when hundreds of millions worldwide suffer hunger, sickness, and winter's cold with no home? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, commissioners. John Veltry, New Mexico resident. I provided a packet of information that Julianne passed out to each of you, as well as to the county manager and also to the county clerk regarding the New Mexico Election Transparency Network. It was private and is now public. The domain is out there. It's nonprofit, faith based, it's a nonpartisan domain. And nmetnetwork.org is where you can find our domain. It's on the business card I provided to you as well. Transparency is the key. We will all work together for a better, better New Mexico. Uh, it's in line with my mission statement that I wrote a year ago. We together, and you've heard me say this many times, can and will make a difference. Um, the information I provided is way more than two minutes worth, so that's why I put some of it together for you. I'll touch on as much as I can for a couple minutes. Um, the table of contents, we talk about government action. We've organized it in three different sections, county, state, and federal. The links allow you to find the sections to contact your elected officials in just seconds. I've tried to do this on the Secretary of State's website, the government's website, and it's taken me hours to find what I need. We put tons of hours and work and effort into this free of charge for you just to go to your county or your state uh, level or your federal level and you can find what you want in just a click. It's made for me. I kind of wanted it set up uh, like for dummies so it would be very easy for anybody to use and find helpful. Uh, we put together a library of information. Uh, lots of documents in there that I would encourage you to look at. We have a place for you to submit tips. Uh, there is a Transparency Times digital newsletter, which is this right here. And this also sponsors some small businesses that I do for free uh, to represent some of the small businesses in the state. And I'm out of time. So you're going to have to look at the rest of this on your own. But I hope you'll find it helpful and interesting. And please call me if you have any questions or Thank email you, me. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, Chair Baca and Commissioners. My name is Ramona Goolsby. During the legislative session, I came to this board and asked for your support in advocating for continued transparency in government, especially in regards with elections and IPRA's requests. But transparency in all operations and departments is important. During the legislative session, SB 180 was passed along party lines that is going to restrict the information the public has access to in regard to our elections and election process. This was very disappointing to many people in the public, especially those who have taken by conscience the um, responsibility to monitor the government. The good news is that the people of New Mexico have the New Mexico Constitution, Article 4, for Section 1 states, the people reserve the power to disapprove, suspend, and annul any law enacted by the legislature, with some exceptions, of course. What a wonderful gift the writers of the Constitution provided for the people of this state. I am happy to inform you that there have been, has been a large grassroots coalition that has been working on the referendum process for many months, before the legislative session even started, and have actually started a referendum project. I am going to encourage you to become familiar with the project. Better Together New Mexico, New Mexico is hosting information on their website about the referendum project, and I'm going to encourage you to check it out. Have a blessed evening. Thank you, Mary. And that concludes public comment.
Thank you. Um, we will move on to 5A uh, communications, um, 2023 legislative outcomes for Bernalillo County. Mr. Clay Campbell and Dan Weeks, welcome. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Clay Campbell. I'm the chief of staff to the county manager and our county lobbyist, Dan Weeks, and I are going to give you a very brief overview of outcomes for the, from the 2023 legislative session. Dan will focus on the legislative policy and, and statutes, and I'll talk a little bit about capital outlay. So with that, Dan. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Um, Chairperson Baca. Um, manager. Um, County Attorney. Uh, my name is Dan Weeks, and I'm your lobbyist. Uh, we just completed the 60-day session. Uh, this report that uh, has been distributed to you includes a, a, an overview of uh, the legislative process, uh, some of the major topics that we were um, pursuing this year, and uh, it's broken up into three sections. I'm not going to go over every bill because there are about 400 of them in the past. Uh, what we've done is broken this down into sections and the sections are basically substantive uh, enactments of legislation and there's subcategories in that uh, involving the budget, uh, economic development, housing, some of the major priorities that the county had put into their resolution this year. Um, I will say that I, I think we did very well I, and I'd like to thank all of you for your involvement. This doesn't happen just going up there in January and starting. This is an annual process year long. And I, I will say that the, the county staff that's involved in this is very competent. I've enjoyed working very much with Clay and uh, Maria and his and their staff. All of the deputies are also very involved. So this is a very comprehensive thing that we do. And I'm pleased to say that I think we came out fairly well this year. Um, my partner, uh, Jason, who happens to also be related to me, uh, handled all the public uh, safety stuff this year and the judicial reform. Uh, there's a separate report coming to you on that. Uh, there was a lot of heavy lifting involved in that, and that was one of our major priorities. So we did very well in workforce. Uh, we've got a lot of money in House Bill 2, which is also delineated in this. Um, the, the things we really need to do to follow up with this is to identify all of the legislation that went through and follow up with the state agencies because a lot of the money that's been appropriated is to the state agency itself and so we're going to have to go up with our proposals or whether they be through RFP or some kind of an allocation process and make sure that we get our piece of the pie from uh, those large appropriations that were made for the specific in specific areas. Um, with that, I would uh, again just like to thank you all for the opportunity to represent you. We had a lot of money this year, uh, a lot of bills. There were over a thousand bills that were introduced, and I'll turn this over to Capital Outlay, which is what everybody kind of gets excited about. So, Clay. Yep. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, really Dan. Appreciate your work. So, yes, commissioners, just briefly. Um, as Dan referred to, you, you all did get a packet earlier today, and a couple of weeks ago on April 12th, I sent you a detailed spreadsheet with just the capital outlay uh, outcomes with all of the appropriations and the amounts for projects, and it's also repeated in the packet that you got today. But just to sum up, we got approximately $23.6 million from House Bill 505 for about 54 different appropriations, which is about 26% of what we requested. A little bit lower than I'd like, but that's what, how it turned out. When we factor in House Bill 2 and, and the money that was given to NMDOT, there's two appropriations in there in the NMDOT appropriations that are coming to us, one for Isleta and one for Atrisco Vista. Those two add up to $16 million, and that bumps up our percentage um, to about 43% of what we requested. Um, and again, all of these individual appropriations are listed in your packet along with some junior bill appropriations that Dan just made reference to that we are getting organized with staff about what we're going to pursue and Madam Chair, um, excuse me Clay um, when when did this packet go out Clay um, uh, Madam Chair uh, Commissioner Benson I believe Julianne distributed it earlier today to you all I might have missed it uh, I don't see it in my email or okay. I have a hard copy for you sir if you like yeah, I would love it. I think the April 14th that you mentioned has a capital outlay, but I don't have Mike the other non-sorry. 
Madam Chair, sorry. I don't have the non-capital outlay. So okay, uh, my apologies, Madam, Madam Chair, Commissioner Barboa. No, Thank you. Uh, we did try to get that out this morning, so we'll follow up right away. Thank you. Uh, but I just want to continue saying regarding, uh, you know, the junior bills, we will be pursuing the ones that are relevant to Bernalillo County. Um, and right now, as far as capital outlay goes, we're tabulating the results over the last five years, going back to 2018, looking at, uh, and only three of those years were legislators required to disclose how much they gave to individual projects. But we want to take a step back and look at um, what we got from whom and what we didn't get and try to adjust our approach accordingly for 2024. So we'll be sitting down with you on those results, if you like, uh, here in May sometime after we tabulate it. Um, I'm hoping that that effort will result in us getting a higher percentage of what we request in future years. Um, I think we also need to consider uh, the number of requests we make, the total dollar value that we request, and to examine more closely the types of nonprofit services and capital projects that we're willing to uh, support. I think all of that will make for a, a even more successful year uh, pursuing capital outlay funding in 2024. So with that, I stand for questions. I do apologize for the document not getting to you. Um, and um, I'm happy, Dan and Jason are happy to sit down with you all and have individual briefings with you about 2023 as well as looking ahead to 2024. And so with that, I stand for questions. Thank you, Clay, and thank you, Dan. It's a lot of work that you have put in, and um, I'm sure that you'll have questions once people have received the packets, so, so maybe one-on-one -on -one later would be okay. a good thing to do. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Olivas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to thank our, our lobbyists, Mr. Weeks and, and Jason Weeks as well, as well as uh, Clay for, for all your work and uh, really enjoyed working with you up at the session this year, working on some of our, our capital outlay priorities as well as our uh, policy priorities. And, and I really just commend the team. I think we've got a, a really great team here working on our, our capital projects as well as our policy work. So, you know, I'm looking forward to this process, working collaboratively with, with you to look at how we change our, our, or modify our capital outlay process to, to make us more successful and, and even more so than, than we already have been. So just want to thank you both for your work and uh, looking forward to the next steps. Madam Chair, Commissioner Olivas, thank you. Thank you very much. Great. So we'll move on to uh, item 5B, Finance, the University of New Mexico Hospital Report, third quarter FY23. Kate Becker, welcome. Thank you. Good evening, and thanks for having me tonight. Um, my report for UNMH is in your packet. That's our quarterly report through the end of March. The numbers are really through the end of February because of when it comes out. Um, but I did want to talk about just three specific things. Um, the first one is I just wanted to thank everybody so far who's participated in our Bernalillo County UNMH listening sessions. And we've had those in three of your districts, and we have two more coming up. So we'll be in Commissioner Benson and Commissioner Olivas' districts shortly. Those have been really well received. And some of the um, feedback that we've gotten from those informs the other two things I'm going to mention. Um, one of them is we did hear quite a bit um, about the need for more access to care, um, particularly from folks who had long wait times or couldn't get an appointment in the time frame that they would like. And I think everybody knows you know, we're a little challenged for providers in New Mexico and certainly at UNMH as well. And so we have a couple of things going on just to make sure you're aware of. The first one is um, we have had some success in recruiting some additional primary care providers, so we're very excited about that, adding some primary care capacity both in our existing clinics, and um, we have the land purchase for a new clinic at Central Gibson, sorry, and 98th, going to HED in May and State Board of Finance in June. So we'll actually be able to break ground on that this summer. So we're very excited about that coming up. And that'll be the same footprint as the 4th Street Clinic, if you're familiar with that. So that's a good size clinic. So we're very excited about that. And then the third thing, um, which we also have heard about from the community in those listening sessions, is the partnership with the county on the Metropolitan Detention Center, which people have been very positive about and seem to be really enthusiastic about. So really happy that we're able to have those sessions with you and really appreciating the feedback that we're getting and hopefully we're being responsive. So with that, happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. And um, the next item is going to indeed be that about the, uh, the jail and, the, and our new uh, joint uh, agreement. So, uh, but if there are any other questions for Kate, Commissioner okay. Barbo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, CEO Becker. Always appreciate you coming to us and all the stuff you put together for us. 
I'm trying to find it now, but I can't. But I believe there was a piece on here about the Resource Reentry Center and UNMH Pathway Navigators. I just want to make sure I understood if that is still true or not. That is still, it looks like County Manager saying. I know I can't find it, so I don't know. It might be harder to, I just want to make sure that I understand. Um, Madam Vice Chair, um, yes, um, they do exist. And so that's one of the things that I was going to bring up is the fact that this is one of the many partnerships uh, that that we have initiatives with UNMH. So they do provide uh, pathways, navigators, or case managers at MDC and at the Resource Reentry Center. Okay, thank you. And then thank you so much for that clarity. I, and then... Um, I just, I did want, I don't know that if it's reflected in here, I was looking at it too, and I'll, I'll do more better at my homework. Um, for security and in relationship with UNMPD, maybe this is a separate conversation, but like, I guess, I guess my question is security needs at the university, knowing that this is the, one of the most dense places where there is, um, you know, just a lot going on at, in the ER, outside and around the university hospital, the psych center being right there. Um, do we feel like the security needs and the relationship? I, I guess I'm just to give a little context too that the um, APD has separated its units that cover including the university hospital. And when I brought it to their attention that you know, what are we doing about the hospital? They were sort of like, oh, that's not our jurisdiction. I think it should be everybody's jurisdiction. And I guess I'm just asking where your thoughts are around both the how security is reflected in the budget if there's need that we're not. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, so UNMH has its own security force. Those are not armed security forces. Um, but those folks, we really appreciate them tremendously because they are trained in thinking of the person involved in whatever incident may arise as the patient um, which is really important in those interactions. And so we do a lot of training with our folks on crisis intervention and de-escalation. And then our security forces also provide that training to our staff. So that's been a really big focus for them. When we need actual law enforcement engagement, we call UNMPD. That's our responsive force. And so UNMPD is the folks who respond to the emergency room or other places if there's a need for a more active level, like if we have an incident that we need to file a report on. And then UNMPD does coordinate with both APD and the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office, as does our security team, to make sure that we're sort of closing the loop on anything that happens. So we do feel like um, we also um, use a lot of cameras on our campus um, because that's a real force multiplier for our security teams. It really gives us a chance to have eyes on without having a huge number of people present because our goal is to be a very welcoming space and people are there to seek care, right? So we want to make sure that they feel comfortable doing that. Hopefully that's helpful. Yes, thank you. I think that was my last question. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, and I'm sure you'll you'll stay for this next a very important item. So thank you, Kate and. Um, County Manager. Sure. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and Commissioners. Um, yeah, we're real excited, uh, no, I am uh, for sure, to present this um, agenda item to you. Um, and so um, I have here, I asked her to, to stay. I call her my partner in crime, and so just a figure of speech, right? But anyway, <laughs> no, she's been, she's been amazing to work with. So... Um, so besides the, the pathways navigators that we talked about, um, uh, UNMH is also providing the medical services at the CARES campus. Um, and that, that's huge. That's the beginning of our, the services that we will be providing at our crisis triage center, which will be opening up probably the first quarter in 2024. Um, yeah, on UNMH's uh, footprint. And Kate was just saying in February. So we're really excited about that. But, um, but also, um, we want to uh, let you all know about and, that, uh, and get this approved, the JPA that creates the MDC Healthcare Authority um, to co-manage the medical, dental, and mental health um, services at MDC. Huge. This is this is a game changer. So just kind of picture a, a triangle where um, they're including the county, 
the hospital and the new authority with one contract like right right in the middle of it. So Bernalillo County will contract with the healthcare authority for medical um, and mental health services and dental services. Um, and of course, uh, this is through the uh, funding that uh, Bernalillo County currently provides to for the medical uh, provider. Uh, that we have right now. So the healthcare authority will uh, contract with UNM Hospital for mental and uh, medical and mental health services and dental services. Um, and then UNMH provides the services and expertise or valuable expertise. Um, UNMH Board of Regents, as you all know, approved this. Um, this was on April 11th, I believe. I remember Kate sent me a text like right away to let me know that it was approved, which is um, awesome news. And so after, um, and, and hopefully it'll be approved tonight, after that, then it'll go to, to DFA for the cabinet secretary, uh, Wayne, uh, props to sign and for that to be fully executed. So the healthcare authority will provide, uh, it'll provide a, a governance structure um, the section four uh, specifies that the healthcare authority board shall be comprised of three UNMH board members and three county board members. So there's six total. And also the authority will ensure the monitoring and oversight of the McClendon um, health, uh, McClendon healthcare domains and are addressed, uh, that are addressed and achieve a substantial compliance. So that is gonna be one of the focal points um, of the contract, and they, we're very, very happy and excited about that. Um, it does not uh, relieve uh, Bernalillo County from the, our court-ordered obligations to McClendon, and also UNMH um, is uh, required uh, to receive approval of a representative of the MDC or designated uh, by myself. Um, and basically, it's, um, it is to have uh, MDC, so that MDC can, can be the training site for UNMH medical school uh, care students, residents, um, and to, uh, to provide services and to learn over. So, so the MDC would basically be a place for folks to learn. And that's really kind of where we started this off, and we never imagined that we would be where we we're at. So um, the uh, warden has been amazing, I think, to work with. Uh, he has uh, welcomed um, UNMH into the facility uh, to um, to begin our, our hard work. And like I say, it's just... It's just a game changer here. Um, so it's forthcoming, uh, the contract scope of work. So since late February, there's been a, some working groups that have been established. So some of the uh, working groups include staffing, the I IT infrastructure, the behavioral health services, dental services, medical services, and pharmacy services. So they've been working, trying to figure out how all that um, is going to be, how those services are gonna be provided um, at the MDC. And is, I just wanna thank Ken. Thank you, Ken, for um, your hard work, um, you at your team, and Scott uh, Souter for all your work on the JPA. I know there's a lot more work to do, but we couldn't do it without you, and we couldn't, do it without your support, um, the support, and, and for saying yes. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Mm -hmm. It's huge. I mean, we're so excited. So the day that we, I heard about it, I told him I, I was going to skip to my car, and I bet you I probably did. <laughs> so, um, but thank you. This, this is, again, this is just a game changer. And just want to thank all the MDC staff. Uh, for working um, with um, with us and with UNMH and being welcoming and being helpful. And uh, with that, I stand for questions. So thank you very much. And again, thank you so much, Kate. And I want to also thank Garnett Stokes for all her help. She's an awesome partner um, and so very helpful with the, the Board of Regents as well. So thank you. I'd like to start off. I know there will be questions from many, many of us up here. But first, I'd like to thank you, um, Kate, and you, Julie, and the warden for working so hard on what I think is just a beautiful relationship and friendship and um, moving this forward in this, in this partnership. So I'm sure there'll be discussion, but I want to go ahead and uh, jump to a motion for approval of this joint powers agreement between Bernalillo County and the Regents of the University of New Mexico to establish 
the Metropolitan Detention Center Health Authority, and also to authorize the county manager to negotiate and execute subsequent agreements and amendments to agreements related to the MDC Health Authority. Second. And it's been seconded. Any discussion? I'm sure. Questions? Madam Chair. Um, yeah, thank you. And thank you, and, and uh, I'll be praying for you. It's going to be a lot of work. And, uh, and I know you're not just running in uh, blindfold. I know you know what you're getting into. But um, we needed a local solution. Um, and we've, we've been trying to make it work with out-of-state agencies. And, um, and so thank you. And please pass on to your board. Thank them for uh, taking this, this step. I know it's not easy, but um, we're committed to it. And I think, I think that's probably why that decision was made because you've seen Julie's commitment and our commitment. And, um, and so I know it's not going to be a perfect solution because it's, it's a complicated situation, but I can't think of a better solution. So thank you so much. Uh, I think thank Vice you. Chair Barbo and then Thank you, Madam Chair. Agree. Just all the thanks all around, also to the warden and for everyone who's making this happen. I think um, you know it's it's going to be a big change for our communities. I just believe it. Know it to be so. Um, I also just want to make sure I understand the um, the medical assisted treatment that gets. And I know before, I'm not sure of this. The what the JPO describes will that be UNMH? Are we still working with? another contractor to do the recovery services. What, where does that lie in this contract or not? Um, so Madam Chair, my, Madam Vice Chair, yes. But the, the exciting part of that too is um, where um, we've enlisted the help of the, some of the ATAB members to help us. Um, and basically what we're going to be doing is we're really going to be enhancing our, uh, enhancing our detox unit and our intake so that we know what to look for. And so we're working on that and we have a, a group of folks that are just, uh, that's all they're doing is they're, we're just, we're trying to do better and there's just been a, in the spirit of cooperation, we're just, we're working with everyone. So yes. Thank you so much. I just wanna say what to get to the yes that the detox and finding different ways and strategies just to make sure that specifically the medical assisted treatment being administered. I know it was passed even before I got onto commission and then it took a while to get it in, implemented and administered. Just that I just want, want to make sure I understand who, where that falls under the. Um, that's still under recovery services. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Sure but, but UNMH will be working with us, um, with them as well. Okay. So. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Commissioner Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to offer the, the deepest gratitude and praise to our, our county manager, to Ms. Becker, for their leadership. This is something that really just, I think, has the potential to enhance our community incredibly. I, I know we don't often think of a jail as a place where, where the community is enhanced, but um, this is about offering that continuum of care that, that leads people on a path of recovery, on a path of, of changing lives, changing habits, and this is just so important to have that local connection uh, where you know it, it's stated in here and it's been said many times that individuals inside of MDC often receive UNMH care outside of MDC, and this offers a, a pathway to, to have that flow, also to have a, a seamless data integration there so that you know we, we know what's happening with individuals regardless of which side of that wall they're on. So this is just, I think it's an incredible development. This was the first county facility that Madam Chair Baca and I toured, I think, it was for me, uh, with, with our county manager and with Warden Jones. And it's, it's been something that uh, from my very early days on the campaign, this was something that was uh, top of mind is, is MDC as, as this really critical piece of, of our criminal justice puzzle. And I think this goes a long way to offering uh, a potential really bright solution and something that in a, hopefully in a few years we can all be very proud of and, and think of as a, as a real accomplishment. So I just want to thank you both and offer my full support for this. Any other questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no, uh, again, thank you so much for the hard work. 
Uh, it's, it's been my passion since I joined the commission. Uh, MDC is in my district, so I've taken it very personally uh, from the get-go and definitely been taking it personally about who we hire as providers. And as we know in this community, UNMH has always been on our side. They are the providers of this community. They are the champions of the people of Bernalillo County. And for them to now partner with us on one of our biggest challenges makes this uh, uh, it, it takes us to a whole other level that I believe is going to really get us on track on how we provide services for residents, right? Because I know a lot of people don't consider the, the people at MDC our residents and our citizens, but they are. And so thank you for believing in that, UNMH, and thank you for uh, believing that we um, can do better and that you want to be a part of that. So with that being said, great work. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So there is a motion on the floor <laughs> and hands raised to the roof. Um, I will call for the vote. All those in favor, um, please signify by saying yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Okay, we'll move on to item six, approval of the minutes. Um, I move approval of the March 28th, 2023 administrative meeting minutes. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> I'm changing that. Okay, item seven is the consent agenda, which has been amended. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you please provide resolution numbers for items 7G and 7L and ordinance numbers for item 7M and 7N. Yes, Madam Chair, for item 7G1, FR 2023-44, for 7G2, FR 2023-45, for 7L, AR 2023-46, 7M, Ordinance 2023-9, and 7N, Ordinance 2023-10. Uh, Thank you, Madam Clerk. So the consent agenda has been published and made available to the public, and uh, therefore I move approval of the consent agenda as amended today. Do I have a se second? Thank you. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And that passes. Madam Chair. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a point of personal privilege here and just thank the individuals on this list that are uh, being appointed to serve on the different boards and, and commissions representing the various districts. Uh, and so I just wanted to extend my deep appreciation to those individuals for their service to our county and to this board of commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Casola. Yeah, thank you. I, I also uh, want to thank, uh, you know, people for getting involved. Um, this is how communities work. This is how the village is raised. So, and, and we all work and we know how much time it takes just to be on one committee, let alone the work that we do up here. Uh, and I just want to do a personal shout out for Angel uh, Garcia, who is a great champion for this community. And as a young man who has uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, really lifted himself up and hasn't forgot about his community as he does so. Uh, I want to thank him again for coming back and serving. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, we will move on to item eight, adoption of or ordinance amendment to the county code. Um, Madam Clerk, can you please provide an ordinance number for item 8A? Yes, Madam Chair. Item 8A, Ordinance 2023-11. Um, we will now convene a public hearing. Uh, Julianne, did anyone sign up to speak? Madam Chair, there are no sign-ups for this hearing. Thank you. Great. Um, the sponsors, Benson and Olivas, do you have any comments? Commissioner Benson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I think the um, fact that there was no uh, public comment uh, reflects the support in this one. Um, we received no opposition uh, verified with county attorney. There was there was no comment in, in anything but support. So um, I think it's a, a good step in the right direction and um, happy to see this get passed. Commissioner Levis. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I want to thank my co-sponsor, Commissioner Benson, and our, our staff, County Attorney's Office, uh, as well as our, our uh, public safety folks that helped draft this and, and get this working. And I also want to give a, give a, a, a real thank you to Councillor Grout, who her and I represent a, a large area of, of districts that overlap. She really started this process at the city of Albuquerque and, and got this going, reached out to Senator Mimi Stewart and, and worked with her on passage of similar legislation at the state level. And now we're able to go in and, and close the net, so to speak, uh, so we've got the city, the county, and the state all speaking the same language, saying in unison that, that we're not going to tolerate this kind of uh, secondhand trade of catalytic converters within uh, our, our borders here. Of course, I think none of us have any illusions that this is going to stop all of that activity. It's not going to stop overnight, but I think this is just an example of, of really trying to work together with our partners to make it harder to commit these crimes, to make it a little easier for individuals that, that are you know, following the law and doing the right thing, try to make their lives a little bit easier. So uh, I urge my colleagues' support, and again, thank you to the staff and, and my co-sponsor for your work on this. Any other comments? Um, did we have a motion to approve? Yeah. I make a motion to approve. Second. It's been moved and seconded. No other discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 And that passes. Thank you both very much for your hard work on this. Um, item 8B, technical services, uh, pro rata ordinance changes. Brian Lopez to present. Madam Chair, members of the Commission, good evening, everybody. Um, I also have uh, with me uh, a technical uh, planner, Julie Luna, and my technical planning manager, uh, Richard Meadows. Uh, we're here to present our technical services item uh, to introduce and approve for publication uh, amendments to Chapter 47, uh, our pro rata ordinance. Um, the Bernalillo County pro rata ordinance was adopted in uh, 2018 with the intent to provide a means of cost sharing. Uh, required for road infrastructure for private development. Um, currently, all roads that are designated as collectors or arterials, which are the larger roads, are excluded from pro rata. Um, this was done uh, because all our collector or arterial roads, uh, as defined in our Chapter 46 of our ordinance, uh, impact fees uh, are eligible to be included in the impact fee uh, capital improvement plan. Um, and a developer cannot be charged for impact fees and be held to pro rata. Um, however, uh, since its implementation, um, it's kind of been shown that the impact fee capital improvement plan only uh, applies to a small subset of those roads um, specifically identified in the plan. And this amendment would open up the eligibility uh, to all roads uh, not uh, included in the plan, um, including improvements to collector and artillery, arterial roads. Um, also, in, in 2018, when the pro rata chapter was developed, uh, it was envisioned to apply to uh, mainly small division, uh, subdivision access roads, and this amendment would allow a mechanism for a cost share uh, based on a traffic impact analysis. Um, although the TIAs do provide a proportionate share of traffic uh, that is uh, generated with the new developments, um, there is no cost share mechanism uh, for those improvements. And what we have seen is just, you know, the cost of a signal at an intersection is, is quite expensive. And so rather than putting it on uh, a particular developer that's coming in first, you know, that would be able to be shared um, through pro rata. Um, and for, so for this item, uh, we're uh, requesting uh, introduction and approval for publication for amendments to Chapter 47 pro rata. Um, should the ordinance be approved for publication, the draft will be posted uh, for the requisite 30 days and then we will return for final adoption on or after the 30-day posting. Um, and with that, we'll uh, take any questions that you may all have. Um, I'll get this started by making a motion to introduce and approve for publication amendments to the Chapter 47 Pro Rata Ordinance. So do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion or questions for Mr. Lopez? No, seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are on item nine, adoption of resolutions. And 
I would like to start with um, 9A is our fiscal year 2024 budget approval. I'm Shirley Reagans is here to speak, but I'd just like to state that we have 9A 1 through 7, and we will discuss them all as a whole, but we will need to then make um, individual approvals of, of each of those items so that we are very clear on, on what we're charged with here today. So, thank you, Ms. Reagans. Oh, I guess I first need to get um, Madam Clerk, but can you provide resolution numbers? Sorry. Yeah, absolutely, Madam Chair. Um, for item 9A1, FR 2023-47, 9A2, FR 2023-48, 9A3, FR 2023-49, and 9A4, AR 2023-50. Madam Chair, Commissioners, my name is Shirley Reagan. I am the Deputy County Manager for Finance. First, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation and thanks to Jennifer Gallegos and uh, our budget manager and her team, Mario, Crystal, Amber, Carlos, Laurel, Jasmine, and Juliana, and Jackie Sanchez, the Accounting and Budget Director, for all of their hard work that they put in compiling and preparing the budget that I'm presenting to you tonight for your approval. I'd also like to acknowledge the county manager, my fellow DCMs, the county attorney, the elected officials, and all of the departments that work to help us develop the FY24 budget. And last but not least, thank you commissioners for being focused, for reviewing the information and providing input concerning your priorities and for most and most of all for the confidence that you placed in me and my team. So with that, I'd like to say that the FY24 budget public hearing was held on Thursday, March the 9th, 2023 in person here at the Ken Sanchez Chambers. Uh, the public was invited to attend, but there was no public comment. The Bernalillo County budget for fiscal year 2024 is presented to the Board of County Commissioners for approval as required by the State of New Mexico Department of Finance and Administration, DFA, Local Government Division. DFA requires budget submittal by June 1st of each year as per State Statute 6-6-2 NMSA 1978. The resolutions presented for the Board's consideration address recurring revenues, operating expenses, debt service, reserve requirements, and cash transfers. The budget represents a balanced and comprehensive view of the county's funding requirements for the next budget year beginning July 1, 2023, including maintaining the DFA 312 reserve requirement of 93.1 million and the revenue stabilization and revenue reserve card known as the minimum fund balance policy of 5% or $18 million. The county recently received a AAA bond rating for all, from all three rating agencies, Fitch, Moody's, and Standard & Poor's. Each rating agency stressed the importance of having solid financials and adequate reserves to weather the economic swings, and this was a key factor when determining our overall bond rating. So um, the budget, I, I, we've spent a lot of time with you all, and so I will, if it's okay with you, I'll just go ahead and start with the motions. And as you said, we'll do them one at a time. So the first motion um, is to approve financial budget resolution FR number one, um, establishing the Bernalillo County, the County of Bernalillo, excuse me, general fund budget of $403,708,763 for fiscal year 24 detailed in attachment A. Um, so I want to start uh, real quickly. I mean, I think that they're going to all flow into uh, one and the next, but um, I just wanted to thank you, Shirley, also the county manager and staff for all of your hard work on, on this budget. It is uh, one of the most important things I believe that the commission is 
charged with, um, and we did take a, a deep dive um, into this, and thank you for listening to us. I, I want to say that, um, and it's in our write-up, but we really have sort of three large umbrella priorities in my mind, and those are that are funded in this budget, and those are public safety, behavioral health, and quality of life. And I know that's a little different than we normally do it, but I think it really articulates um, a lot of the detail as we go through all of these these motions, these these seven items on the agenda today. So I wanted to thank you, staff, county manager, um, very much, um, and Ms. Reagan for your your hard work on that. Um, so I guess I, I will move approval of item one FR twenty twenty three dash forty seven. Second. And it's been seconded. And discussion. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, I'd like to move an amendment. I believe uh, you all have this in front of you here. It's uh, Amendment 1 to add this, and this is what we're adding after the conclusion of this, add this includes an appropriation of $250,000 for overtime for the Sheriff's Office use and protection of community assets, including but not limited to schools, medical facilities, and places of worship. The sheriff shall provide a report to the commission annually in the month of August beginning in 2024 on the use of these funds by facility type. It also includes an appropriation of $40,000 for pilot program to fund EMT training and courses at BCFR. So um, that's been moved and seconded. Um, so we'll discuss the, um, the motion on the floor, the amendment rather. Any questions for Commissioner Olivas? Madam Chair. Commissioner. If I could just uh, briefly give a, a little bit of context to this, this is uh, funding that is already in the budget in one form or another, and this uh, amendment, the intent here is merely to, to call out these key priorities uh, as Commissioner, as uh, Madam Vice Chair Barboa discussed earlier, uh, issues like security at, at UNM Hospital. This, this allows and, and just calls out that, that there is specific funding in this budget to address those really key priorities. We, we know that uh, safety of, of our youth in their schools, folks seeking medical treatment, uh, folks in their, in their places of worship. These are all key community assets where individuals in our community deserve to feel safe. And uh, I wanted to make sure that this was, was called out uh, and, and recognized that this is part of our budget. Thank you, Commissioner. Madam Thank Chair. Commissioner Briggs. Um, just, just seeing the, the language here, I think when we're making the uh, sheriff's department a priority, we're making public safety a priority, and I, uh, I stand in support of that. Thank you. Any other comments on the amendment? So I will call a vote on the amendment to this item. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Great. So now we are back to I the budget just resolution. I a little bit of a post comment. I should have. Sure. The opportunity. Uh, just to say, I, I noticed that the um, it does remove um, some behavioral health positions, um, which I know we're in the process. I just want to. Oh, no, that's, that's no. another amendment. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'll wait till then. then. I approve. No comment. So back to the um, the resolution, the budget resolution. Is there any other uh, comments or questions of Ms. Reagan? I did just want to thank uh, Ms. Reagan and, and of course our county manager and, and all of your staff for, for the hard work that, that you all have done on this and especially for us new commissioners I know that, that we come into this a little bit green and, and what the process looks like and how it works but I really do appreciate your patience and, and your, your really genuine desire to work with us and, and listen to our priorities and, and help us achieve uh, what Madam Chair Baca outlined really being these, these key core investments in public safety, behavioral health, and quality of life. And that's really reflected across these motions. And, and I believe uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of those in, in subsequent motions. But in this one, I think what's really germane is, is the investments that we're making in uh, competitive wages for uh, all of our staff. Uh, of course, this includes a, a 3% across the board increase being proposed for, for our, our rank and file staff. Um, and it also proposes additional increases for some of our really key public safety positions. And, and that's just critical that we really focus on this core priority that we know is, is a, a crisis in our county. And, and there's real need to invest in that and make sure that 
we are competitive in attracting and retaining and recruiting uh, individuals in our community to serve. These are, are difficult positions, as, as we heard Commissioner Benson recognize tonight, uh, some of our folks in emergency dispatch. Uh, th this is not easy work, and it's our obligation as, as public servants to, to recognize that and ensure that the budget reflects those investments. And I'm really proud to say I believe this budget does. So I appreciate your work and commend your staff for, for making that happen. Madam Chair, one other comment. I completely agree with Commissioner Levis, but also what is kind of woven into this budget, which I think a lot of the public takes for granted is, is the uh, debt service that the county pays, which is extremely low uh, because of our AAA, AAA plus bond rating. Is that is that the correct rating? Just AAA. AAA. <laughs> I'll give it a plus. That's the highest one. <laughs> I'll give, I'll give this an we have the highest uh, bond rating score, and um, and and that takes so much work uh, that that we never even see, uh, thanks to you and your department, and, um, uh, and and there's items in the budget which feed into that, but then it also benefits from that. But I know our our reserves feed into that, um, having a, um, a a large safety net for any emergencies and. Um, I just thank you for all the work that you've done, and, and it benefits the taxpayers because, because of all that work. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, so I will uh, call for a vote on approval of the financial budget resolution FR 2023-47. All those in favor, as amended. Uh, Aye. By saying Aye. 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 And that passes. Ms. Reagan, item number two. So item number two is approve the financial budget resolution number two, FR 2023-48, establishing the County of Bernalillo non-general fund budget of $248,813,273 uh, for FY24 detailed in attachment A. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions or discussion? Okay. Call for a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 That passes. Thank you. Item three. Okay. Motion. Oh, I need to vote. I'm sorry. Go ahead, okay. Ms. Reagan. Um, number, the motion three is approve financial budget, budget resolution number three, uh, FR 2023-49. Establishing the County of Bernalillo carryover budget for multi-year projects of $322,631,244 for FY24 detailed in attachment B. And so moved. Do I have a second? second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion or questions? Seeing none, a call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Doing great. Ms. Reagan. Item number four. Okay. Uh, the next one is approve administrative resolution FR 20, I mean, excuse me, AR 2023-50 to support the grants and projects listed in attachment C funded by various sources in FY24 for the receipt of federal and state funding. And that's so moved. Any Second. Second been moved and seconded. Any questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And that passes. Item 9A5. Before I read uh, the, the fifth motion, you all were handed a revised attachment D. When we initially prepared it, we um, had included the uh, deputy officer for the open space conservation um, there was four positions. We had reflected them under Parks and Rec in the Community Services Division. We just moved them down under Public Health, under the Sheriff's Office, who will be administering that program. So that was the only change that I wanted to say there. Um, so the fifth motion is to approve 58 new full-time regular positions um, detailed in Attachment D. So moved. I have a second. Second. Been moved and seconded. Madam Chair. Commissioner Olivas. 
I wanted to offer an amendment to item 9A5 to strike the number of positions from 58 to 56 uh, per the second part here, remove behavioral health initiative special projects coordinator and remove behavioral health initiative program coordinator. Second. Uh, if I may, Madam yes. Chair. I just wanted to give some context to this. So uh, this list of, of new positions being created does include uh, what I think is is really a, a, a bold move on on the part of our, our county manager and and all all of our staff here to really invest in leadership position in the uh, behavioral health initiative and, and in the behavioral health uh, portfolio. So we are are creating a position for a deputy county manager of the behavioral health initiative, along with investing in some data analysts in that department. Uh, that really move us in the direction that I think that you know we've we've heard from the public that this is important, and we also have our behavioral health work group uh, that is doing ongoing work in this space and and really working hard and giving uh, crafting some great feedback. And so, uh, the reason for removing these positions at this time is not to direct the funding to any other particular place or or source. This is really just to sort of hit a pause on, on these positions to give some time to reboot and, and figure out what we're gonna get from the behavioral health work group, what may happen as, as we look to fill this new leadership position at the, the deputy county manager level uh, and give some flexibility both to that manager and, and to our behavioral health work group that is doing some great work and, and I think is gonna give this commission and our county manager, all of our, our leadership, at the, at the Behavioral Health Initiative now and future, some really good recommendations. So this just says a, a pause on this, the, those, that, that money is still there, it's available, and of course, uh, I know that we can, uh, the staff can bring a resolution or, or commissioners can bring a resolution at any time to bring these positions back or, or allocate those funds to other positions or other needs within that space. So I, I would urge my colleagues' support. And I'd like to say I, I, I will support this um, amendment. Um, I think that we have really done a good job in working with the administration and county manager, and thank you very much for that. And we're uh, really looking forward to the working, the citizen working group that I, I believe is going in the direction that, that our budget is allowing them to um, really direct us in improving our behavioral health initiative. And so th I think this is reflective of that as well as um, all of those nice words that Commissioner Oliva said. So I'll, I'll support this. Uh, Vice Chair Barboa. I just have a quick um, note to say, because I think, um, and thank you for Commissioner Olivas for bringing this. I think it's important that we, just to what to ditto what Commissioner Olivas said, that right, if when we are, we're in a bit of a, the world is a, in a different place now than we were years ago. And thankfully we have this, um, our behavioral health budget, we have it as a priority at the county. And it does feel like a time of reset when, you know, you, you now you see things on TV about addressing mental health, behavioral health needs at, of all ages. And um, thankfully, it's becoming less stigmatized. And I think as we're um, getting the opportunity to reshape, reconfigure, and hopefully innovate how we do meet the needs. You know, we're a county um, government. And I often say, like, because that we're not... Um, we're not a nonprofit or a private company that gets to decide who we work with or if we work with the, I always say, the good addicts or the good homeless people, right? We have to take the folks and, and in partnership with University Hospital and others that um, we help distribute these funds to, um, yeah, we're taking care of the folks that need it with, and we need to be the least barrier between MDC, between the way that we provide behavioral health and addiction treatment specific services. Um, we really have to uh, to meet that need as it as it has only continued to grow. So I support this. I'm thankful for bringing it, and um, and thankful for everybody that worked on this. Okay. Madam Any Chair, discussion on the amendment. Yes, uh, I'm I'm a little confused about it, to be honest with you. Um, if 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 those are what we're going to need, eventually, why wouldn't we just have them there? And that way, it doesn't have to go right back through us again. That when that's one of the uh, suggestions from the committee to do that, that the county manager can just pull that trigger right away. It just, if it's not gonna, if we're not gonna reallocate those funds somewhere else right now, 
and that's just going to keep those positions for me. I think we should just keep those on, keep them on the list uh, and keep moving forward and then not hire until we actually have, you know, the recommendations that we want from the committee. That's just my opinion. Uh, it just makes it, you know, we're doing the work right now. Let's just do the work now. And then that way staff can do it when, when we get to those bridges to cross them. I just think it's just adding extra work. So I, I, I'm not going to support this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to make a comment on that. So, so the existing listing of these um, budgeted positions um, adds actually the deputy county manager and two data specialists than what was presented in back in early April or in, in, at our budget hearing, March, sorry, in our budget hearing. So we actually are adding the emphasis on the leadership of this deputy county manager and to a very important data um, specialist because that is what we've heard. The real, real need is um, a strong leadership team and the integrated data um, analysis and data uh, work and reporting, basically, when I say data, reporting on, on our outcomes of our behavioral health initiatives. So there are three additional positions um, that were not anticipated when staff recommended these project coordinator and the, the other one that, uh, what is the other one? A program coordinator Pro program and coordinator. Special, special project special coordinator. Project. Yeah, and so I, I believe that it, it was a, a, a reset and um, I, I don't know, I guess I would defer to Commissioner Olivas to explain further, but that's my understanding of it, Commissioner Casella. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I'm happy to, to explain further, but I think, um, you know, the bottom line is here, these are, are positions. I, I did actually request uh, staff to give responses on all of the new positions, or I, I think it was almost all of them. A few of them I, I conferenced with different DCMs and department heads individually, and, and so I asked for, for descriptions of, of each job, what, uh, what was the intended purpose, and uh, what what my feeling on this was, was that the, the purpose that was described here uh, may not be in line with this leadership reset and this, uh, the, the changes that I think that, that those of us that are, are following closely what the work of the, the behavioral health work group is doing uh, may really suggest a, a change in directions. And then of course this new leadership may come in and, and also want a change in direction. So again, this, this doesn't preclude bringing these positions back in the future or changing them entirely to something else that is needed because I think it's important that we have uh, some funds available there for new leadership and for the recommendations of the work group to actually be able to go into action when those hit and, and actually hit the ground running. So I think that uh, that's the reason I'm bringing this and I, I continue to, to urge my colleagues' support. Any other discussion on the amendment? So I will call a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. And that passes on a 4-1 vote. So back to the actual motion of, as amended, approval of 56 new full-time regular positions, as detailed in the um, updated. Um, so you want me to read the motion with 56 so that it can, or? Well, I think okay. that it's. it's been I think you are, did, or did you just vote on the amended motion? So I don't need to. Okay, just want to make sure. Thank you. <laughs> so just, let, Thank I'll, you. I'll just clarify that the, the motion on the table is approval of fifty-six new full-time regular positions, yes. detailed in I, uh, attachment D, because that is the amended motion on the floor. Yes. Second. Or yes. If you want to. Second. <laughs> Madam Chair. Uh, I wanted to just say one last thing here to highlight uh, several of these new positions that I think are just really critical investments in, in our county and in our people and, and the core missions. So, for example, we have uh, economic development. That's really a department that, you know, that it, when you put money into economic development, that's an investment back into the community that, that grows our gross receipts revenues, our, our property tax revenues as, as we invest in new businesses and recruiting businesses and we grow our, our economy here and, and ultimately help the operations of the entire government. Uh, talking about investments in behavioral health, uh, while we just removed a couple of positions, this actually adds four, uh, sorry, 
three new mobile crisis teams, two, one at the fire department and two in the sheriff's department. So these are highly trained uh, crisis response clinicians paired with deputies or, or in the case of fire, uh, paramedic EMTs. Uh, so again, this is, this is investing in, in the core frontline staff that do the work every day of responding to behavioral health calls in addition to those investments that Commissioner Baca outlined in uh, leadership and data analysts, which we know are, are areas where we need to make investments in behavioral health. Uh, at the Sheriff's Department, adding those positions in the mobile crisis teams, but as well as these uh, positions in open space conservation, which is you know just a key space that is one thing that we just do really well as a region, our, our open spaces and parks and, and those kinds of facilities. And so this commission is, uh, if, if this resolution is passed, is making a commitment to reinvest in those spaces and ensure the, the protection of those areas. And lastly, I wanted to highlight the Burnco Clean Team, which again is just a, a bright spot in our public works department. We have individuals on that team going out and cleaning up illegal dumping. We heard about earlier in some of our zoning meetings, tire dumps and things like that out on the Pajarito Mesa. We've got the same thing going on in the East Mountains, North Valley. This is stuff that, that's affecting our entire county. And so uh, that's about investing in quality of life, uh, really looking at our community and saying we can do better. And this is our, our government here at Bernalillo County in this commission saying that, that we're gonna invest in that. We believe in this community and, and it's time to do better. So uh, I urge my colleagues support on this and, and I absolutely support these positions because I think this is gonna move us in the right direction as a county to, to reinvest in our community. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments? I guess I would just echo the, the quality of life part. We've talked a lot about public safety, but to me, uh, these this clean team and our open space positions under unit under BCSO are really an investment in quality of life, but they are also about public safety. If you have clean, green streets, you have less vandalism, you have less crime. It is a, a proven uh, statistic. And it, not only are these officers in, the, in BCSO there to... Um, they are proactive officers that will be fully um, sworn officers. They protect our visitors as well. So it's a real public safety quality of life overlap, and I'm, I'm very proud of that, I, and I thank you for including them. So, um, Madam Chair? Yes. Yeah, and I think that the open space uh, is huge. You know, as you all know, I went to Santa Fe and gave the money to make sure that they have four-wheel drives that go up into the Pajarito Mesa. I've got dirt bikes that we bought for the sheriffs to go up there. Um, Pajarito Mesa is the Wild West. It's a very dangerous place. And for us just to have our staff go up there, um, uh, it always gives me uh, pause, right, because I don't know what's going up there. Um, and one of the things that I've been asking for is a, is a drone. Uh, I've been trying to get a drone for a while now. I think that's a better way to, um, to look at, you know, areas and open space areas to patrol it. So we're not actually putting officers or putting people in harm's way. There's other ways now with technology to look at these uh, areas. Uh, and that would bring down some of the budget. And then we're not relying so much on our officers to be up there. But, you know, uh, we like I said, I have a monthly meeting on Parito Mesa every uh, once a month, and, you know, we don't really talk about those vehicles being up there. We're coming into better weather now, so I'm not blaming anybody, and I know that they're short-staffed. So is there other technologies that we can implement using our, our dollars to make sure that we're monitored these places? There's a road up there that we that I've convinced Wall to give over to P&M where it's, it's an access road, uh, and to donate that to P&M so then we can monitor it, gate it, and if people are going through the gates, we'll have cameras there. We've got to go into the 20, you know, into year 2023 with how we are doing work. And sometimes it's not just putting uh, boots on the ground, but it's implementing technology. So I'm hopeful that we as a commission, uh, or at least we'll get staff to look at some of those options for us to look at. But I agree with all the rest of the positions. They're great. Uh, I'm even amazed that, you know, I think I'm going to go back to be a lifeguard. That's $52,000 a year to, to be a lifeguard. I can't. I don't know how to swim. But, uh, but I think that's a great job for a young, you know, high school student or college student to have to supplement. So I just want to 
implore anybody who's watching this meeting tonight, if you have somebody in your family that, that needs a job, um, we've got a bunch of jobs here at Bernalillo County uh, from starting all kinds of different positions, and we would really like you to come and join Bernalillo County and, and work for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Casada. No further discussion. I will ask for a vote on uh, item 9A5. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And that passes. Thank you. So, Ms. Reagan, 9A6. Yes. Um, this is kind of a long one. It says, authorize the county manager or designee pursuant to administrative resolution 2018-49 to execute all agency contracts and cooperative agreements on behalf of the BCC as detailed in the contract listing attachment E and attachment E1 and authorize the county manager or designee to amend contract prices in accordance with the limits stipulated in administrative resolution 2018-49. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. And questions? Discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And that passes. Aye. Item 9A7. Is to authorize the county manager or designee pursuant to administrative resolution 2018-49 to seek reimbursement to the general fund for any project or initiative funded by the general fund that subsequently receives funding in whole or in part from an alternative uh, funding source, such as another agency, bond proceeds, or grants. If the amount exceeds the county manager's authority, the item will be presented to the Board of County Commissioners for approval. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any comments, discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And that passes. Ms. Reagan. Ms. I just want to say sorry. thank you again for approving the budget. The real work begins now. Uh, my budget team here getting the details, finite details into the system, working with HR um, and the departments on the positions, getting making sure the job descriptions are, are solidified and understanding when we need to get them posted so that they'll be ready for when the departments are, you know, ready to move forward with those. So thank you again, and um, we're looking forward to working with you as we start our next big task, which is just a couple months down the road, is going to be the development of the FY25-26 biannual budget. So thank you again. Thank you, Sure. Okay, so we now move on to item 9B, Office of Criminal Justice and Behavioral Health Initiatives. Madam Clerk, can you please provide a resolution number? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, item 9B3 is FR 2023-51. And Senior Manager Pam Acosta and Sheriff Allen. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Madam Vice Chair and Commissioners. Um, my name is Pam Acosta. I'm the Senior Manager for the Behavioral Health Initiative, and I'm accompanied by Sheriff John Ellen and the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office team in the audience, uh, bringing before you a proposal which seeks 450,000 in one-time non-recurring funding to assist the B Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office in creating a Community Assistance and Supports Team, also known as CAST to expand its social work and victim advocacy services within Bernalillo County. Currently, high utilization of BCSO services make it nearly impossible for the department's two, two full-time licensed clinical social workers and one full-time victim's liaison to adequately meet the needs of hundreds of individuals who come in contact with law enforcement each month. In, 20, in 2022, BCSO responded to over 132 calls and of these, 15,473 reports were taken requiring follow-up. By building a larger support team, CAST would do two things. One, allow BCSO to better serve and assist hundreds more families, victims, survivors of crime, and justice-involved individuals to receive adequate services and obtain advocacy. 
and two, add additional support to detectives and deputies by allowing greater access to social worker and victim liaison services during field calls. BCO, BCSO has applied for a grant through the Bureau of Justice, and if approved for both, will, they will combine the funds for a total of $1 million to be utilized over a period of three years where performance metrics and data will be collected and evaluated to determine program efficiency. BCO's active partners in this effort will be the Office of Criminal Justice and Behavioral Health Initiative, the Department of Behavioral Health Services Care, uh, Care Campus, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council's Reentry and Divergence Subcommittee, um, the, the BHI's Crisis Subcommittee as its advisory group, and Bernalillo County Fire and Rescue and Albuquerque Police Department as its partners in the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program and mobile, mobile crisis teams. The proposal was presented to the BHI Crisis Subcommittee and BHI Steering, both unanimously recommending the proposal move forward to the Bernalillo County Commission for final consideration. Per Administrative Resolution 2020-51, in the absence of a meeting for the month of April 2023, the proposal was shared with ABCGC plus APS members via email. If it will please the Commission and Madam Chair, I'm accompanied by Sheriff Allen, Under Sheriffs Jareno Har Jareno and Williamson, Major Anderson, and the very pivotal and very pivotal to the proposal, Captain Watkins, Lieutenant Dudowitz and social workers and victim advocate, Desiree Trujillo, Samantha Groves, and Tara Kasten, who are available to take questions or provide further information or examples of some of the cases that they are assigned to. Otherwise, we await your final disposition to this proposal. Thank you. Sheriff, would you like to say a few words? A, a couple of things, um, just to let everybody know, especially the, the community we serve, uh, it's a new day and age in the Sheriff's Office. And it's also time to make sure that we take care of the people with mental health issues, drug addiction, and make sure that we have the right personnel, uh, but also make sure that we have the proper structure uh, before we ask for any more uh, money and to also show that we are fiscally responsible by applying for grants. That way the burden is not totally on the, uh, the, the commission and the citizens of Bernalillo County. Uh, the staff that I have here in the crowd, I'd like to thank them. It's not me. I wouldn't be anything without all of them in the crowd. And uh, Captain Watkins, Lieutenant uh, Dudowitz have done a ton amount of work and research and made sure that not only are we fiscally responsible, uh, but we're providing the services to our community and also uh, the services to keep the mental health of our deputies. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Allen and Pam, both of you for your leadership on this. This is a, 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 I intend to support this. Um, any other questions or Mr. Um, I just thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say thank you, Bull. Thank you to everyone who, obviously, the strong team that it takes to make this. When I, to be honest, when I first saw it, I was like, "Wait, we're taking this behavioral health dollars for law enforcement initiatives that I know intersect. I know our law enforcement is often the first face that folks um, struggling with behavioral health, mental health issues." Are. So I just appreciate your efforts to bring to close that gap between the, you know, crime and the way our officers are approaching um, folks with behavioral health and mental health issues. So when I first saw it, I was like, but wait, 450,000 at behavioral health, we have such little dollars anyways. But then when they see and thank you, Pam, for sending all the detailed information our way to see that. Just like you said, Sheriff Allen, we are leveraging federal dollars. We're using the monies responsibly over a period of time. We're thinking creative and innov innovatively to bring more, to leverage those dollars for more dollars for our communities. So I'm just so um, pleased and thankful for all the work you did to make this happen. Madam Chair. Commissioner um, uh, Ms. Costa or uh, Sheriff Allen either uh, can answer. Um, how would the... Four hundred fifty thousand uh, be used in terms of it's it's non-recurring, correct? Um, however, it's for permanent solutions. So, how uh, can you explain how that is reconciled? Uh, Madam Chair and Commissioner Benson, um, the $450,000 would be spread over three years. It's a match requirement for the grant, the Bureau of Justice Administration grant. Um, and so it would be spread to provide that sustainability. You have to demonstrate sustainability in a grant, so it would be providing that. If they are not awarded the grant, the $450,000 would be used over a period of three years to start the program with less positions. Thank you. Also, I, um, 
just want to add on to um, Commissioner uh, Barboa's comments and, and the importance of uh, child welfare and, and the work that you're um, focusing on with CYFD. I think it's, uh, everybody's been reading about it in the paper. It's, it's, um, it needs a lot of help. And so uh, the support you're going to be providing there is greatly appreciated. So I support it as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Olivas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Acosta and Sheriff Allen for, for bringing this item. Uh, so one question before my comment. So this, this, does, this money does fund new positions for additional crisis navigators and, and victim advocates, that, that sort of thing, correct? Absolutely. Yes, that's correct. Okay. And those are county positions uh, internal. This is not through a contractor? That's correct. One would be contracted, um, the mental health liaison or compliance uh, manager, and then the other three would would be for uh, uh, they would be called forensic navigators, and they would be under the supervision of the social work department or the social the licensed social workers. Understood. So, I, I think this kind of dovetails on what Commissioner Benson was saying about. Um, I, I think that this is not really non recurring funding. This is recurring funding. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned, even though I think this is an awesome program, this is something very much in need. Not only are we, in my opinion, going to be on the hook for this 450000 essentially in perpetuity, but the federal match is likely to sunset after three years. Maybe we get lucky and get it, you know, a renewal or something like that. But it seems very likely that uh, if this is over a three-year period, we're likely con committing ourselves to about a million dollars every three years in supporting this resolution uh, and that we just passed a, a budget and that is not reflected in the budget is is that correct as a recurring item Madam, Madam Chair and Commissioner believe us yes that's correct um, so I, something that I should mention is, is that the positions will be term term positions um, and in year two of this three-year project, they would evaluate the data to look at its efficacy and see if it's worthy to continue the program, if it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. And at that time, Sheriff Allen and his team will look at under other funding sources and including the BCSO budget. And um, I'll also defer to Sheriff Allen if he has anything else to add. Yes, and uh, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, um, we have to start somewhere. And even if that's three years, we know that we can also adjust uh, we don't know if we'll need all these positions as we move on, uh, but I think it's important to make sure we at least build that foundation, whether or not we uh, take away from the positions or whether or not we add to them. I know we're not completely depending on the grant because we know it's not reoccurring and it's for three years, uh, but I would like to take at least a little chunk and at least attempt and see the efficacy of the program and see if it's even pertinent to put into another FY budget. Thank you. Uh, just going to finish my thought there. So... Um, I, I appreciate that transparency, and, and I just want to be clear to, to the public and to my fellow commissioners that, that when we're supporting this, um, I find it very unlikely, as, as it often is, when, when we create new positions, it's very unusual to get rid of them, and especially on that short of a timeline, three years or a couple years. So I think it, it needs to be very clear that we are likely committing to funding this for a significant period of time. I think it's, it's a good program. It's a good use. Um, but I do just want to make very clear that this is uh, a recurring use of funds, in all honesty, that's being advertised as non-recurring, but it is very likely to eventually transition into permanent support of these positions, which are important positions, and, and I think that the, the end goal here justifies the means, but um, I think that that's something that across the board we've, we've got to improve and, and get more serious about when things are recurring commitments versus when they're non-recurring. Mr. Casada. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, exactly. Um, you know, that's uh, uh, through APS, we would uh, unfund mandates all the time and then ended up having to figure out how we get it in the budget uh, based on the data. And I, I agree. I think this is a much needed uh, program. I think it's, it's most likely they're not going to be really successful. Uh, and we're going to get data, you know, uh, to collaborate that, I'm pretty sure. Um, so my question is, would be to staff is, you know, since we are dealing with, um, you know, um, 
things that are systemic from drug abuse and, and those sorts of things. Can we look at some of the opioid, opioid money? Because, you know, that's coming up next, and we're already starting to allocate some of that. So can we, I, I know I'm getting a bad look over here, uh, but can we, can we allocate some of that for some sustainability, you know, a little further than three years to, so it doesn't really hit the budget right now? Because that's not really, the opioid money money's not in the budget right now, is it? Next one. What's in the budget right now? Uh, Commissioner, for the opioid money is what we have received, $3.9 yeah. $3. million. Okay. It's in the non-general fund. So it, it is in the budget? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. That's why I'm getting that dirty look. Um, that's all right. You can give me a look. <laughs> I, I get it. The budget's hard. But I think I'm just, I have to agree with, uh, you know, um, with um, Commissioner Olivas that we have to be transparent, um, that we're going to have to figure out how to fund this. Uh, because we start out non-funding or, or non-reoccurring, and in order to do things right, we got to figure it out. So at least we, you know, Sheriff, that we're uh, ahead of the game and that we know that coming up, we're going to have to figure out to make sure that this is funded uh, even, because right now we don't even know if we got the grant or not. Uh, and so we're going to put this 450, uh, you know, into it. I think we got to pull the trigger on the program and not really rely on now, whether you're going to get the grant or not, because I think this work's important, Sheriff, and I want to thank you for bringing this this work forward. It adds, it adds, you know, it adds a real, I think, a hole in our behavioral health services that we provide because you are on the spot. You are there when things are happening. You see families in crisis. You're you're there when that stuff is happening, and that is the best place to address that. And we know that. Right. Either either through the sheriff's department or the fire department, which either one, you know, they're there on the scene at the time. And that's where we have to kind of stop that leak. And so that's what we've been trying to figure out the best use for our dollars. So I'm going to have to agree. I'm going to support it. Uh, and then we're going to have to figure out how we're going to support it long term. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, were you gonna say that? If I may, Madam Chair, just to say to that point and. Three years, I may not be here. I go up for re-election next year. <laughs> but if I am, I will. Um, I mean, I really do, just to the points that's already been made, the evaluation, and you you made the point, um, Senior Manager Acosta, that right. we have to be really clear about evaluations. I'm sure if this program is, we have, we're doing new things. The world is changing, and um, we're doing new things. And if it isn't working, I'm sure the, the Sheriff's Office can absorb, absorb those into those positions into other places. I just don't, I mean, I, I know that that's what typically happens, but I promise that I am going to hold to, um, you know, following evaluations, following data, and not that, because we need to try something else if it's not truly working. Um, so I just, I just want to add that last comment that I will be back saying that again if I'm still here or, or calling in as a constituent. Madam Chair, if I may address uh, Vice Chair, um, your comment, I just want to let you know that a requirement of the grant does require performance metrics um, each year. So that is a requirement and responsibility. And even without the grant, BHI funding does require performance metrics as well. So thank you. Well, I'd like to move um, approval of item 9B1 through 3. If I can do that all together that we've been t discussing. Um, do I have a second? Sorry. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Concerns? All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we move to uh, item 10 on the agenda. Uh, 10. What was 10B Community Services? Uh, Director Tia Bland to present. A uh, motion to approve the installation of a memorial bench in honor of Riley Eric Hine at Carlito Springs Open Space and East Mountains. Madam Chair, Commissioners, I'm Tia Bland, uh, Communication Services Director, and 
chair of the county's internal uh, memorial and naming committee. Uh, we currently have a naming proposal that was submitted to us by um, Tejeda's resident Eric Hine and his son actually passed away in a very tragic car accident um, a few years ago. Actually, it was 2015. And uh, Mr. Hine submitted a proposal to us asking if um, we would consider naming uh, a memorial bench and place it at the Carlito Springs open space in honor of his son. Uh, his son was on his way to um, a high school event uh, on one morning and encountered a semi truck and uh, there was a, a fire and basically the son died from the injuries of the fire. And Carlito Springs uh, open space apparently was a very special place for this young man and he has spent a great deal of time there and the father again just wished to um, create a memorial bench there so that others the family their family and also others could also enjoy it and meditate be contemplative all the things that you do in a very beautiful space like Car Carlito Springs open space so part of the committee's process is to ask um, the public to comment for at least 30 days and so we did do that and we received probably 15 or 20 comments from members of the public and they were all supportive of this particular proposal and uh, the naming committee also supports it as well. I will answer your questions if you have them. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to um, adopt the naming committee's recommendation to approve this, this bench. Second. It's been moved and seconded. And if, Any other comments? Madam Chair, if I could just say a few words. I, I ask that this item be pulled from the consent agenda. Um, just a, a really tragic story uh, about a, a resident in my district, a young man with a, a bright future. I think he said he was a band student at Monsanto High School, uh, enjoyed the, the outdoors. And so I uh, wanted to just take a couple of minutes to just you know, recognize that and, and recognize the tragic loss that, that our entire community experienced that day, but especially our East Mountains community. Um, but in, in that vein, I also wanted to say that, you know, in, in that death comes new life. And so I think that's important to highlight that we're going to be reopening Carlito Springs uh, in just a couple of weeks. I think it's actually been set. It hasn't really been announced, but uh, I guess I'm kind of announcing it here for May 6th. Uh, and I think that as that's a celebration of opening this facility, it's also a celebration of this young man's life uh, and, and the, the tragedy that, that his family experienced. So I just want to, you know, comment on that and invite the public to that celebration of, of that renovated space. It's a beautiful, beautiful space, Carlito Springs. I, I just had a chance to tour that a couple weeks ago with some of our, our uh, county staff. And I think that it's just a, a gem in our open space system. And I think it's... Uh, while incredibly tragic, the, the loss of life of this young man, it's, it's really a, a beautiful place for this placement of this bench. And, um, just appreciate you bringing this item, and I appreciate his family uh, asking for this to be there. So I fully support this. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, item 10. C, Fleet and Facility Management, uh, Elias Archuleta to present. Good evening, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Jared Avett. I'm the Director of Fleet and Facilities for Bernalillo County, and I have Elias Archuleta to support me as needed. This uh, item is the scheduled renewal of our janitorial services contract. The contract was up after a four-and-a-half-year contract period. The purpose of this proposal is to have one single janitorial services provider for the county. Uh, through a qualifications-based bid, or, or um, not bid, but proposal, rather. Uh, the intent, of course, is to select the vendor based on those qualifications. And once the pricing is set forth for all the facilities encompassed in the proposal, we then have the option to add or subtract services as needed. And I stand for any questions. Any questions? Uh, Vice Chair Barbo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, I just a quick question. This is for janitorial, one janitorial service for all county facilities. 
Madam Chair, Commissioner, uh, not for all county facilities, just for about 340,000 square feet of facilities. We have nearly two and a half million square feet throughout the entire we have county. How much? Sorry, if you could. Two, two and a half million square feet is what we have. Facilities. And this is covering. And this is covering a little bit. Um, it's more practical for us to contract out some of the offshoot facilities where county staff is more centered, like here at Alvaro Square, we have county facilities staff that perform custodial services. Oh, okay. And does this not include MDC or not? This does not include MDC. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair. Commissioner Olivas. Um, I guess my question on this was regarding the fairly significant increase, I, I realize in the context of, you know, the large budget we just approved, this isn't a huge increase, but um, looking at going from $209,000 to $617,000, I, I realize we've definitely seen some inflation-related increases and, in, you know, different areas and, and that sort of thing, but uh, that's a, a really significant increase, uh, you know, 200%, I believe, uh, increase. So. What, what's the rationale behind that? Madam Chair, Commissioner, uh, largely based on a quote that we received from the industry, we were intending to fill a gap between the expiration of the contract and the renewal of the contract and seek some quotes to, to try and see what that might cost us. Those quotes came back to anywhere from two to five times what we were currently paying under our agreement. Uh, keep in mind this agreement was four and a half years old. Um, gas prices, labor prices were much lower four and a half years ago. Um, we feel that the most likely this contract is going to come back. We don't know the results of the, the RFP just yet. It's still an open bid and it's not yet disclosed. Um, but we anticipate it will come back two and a half times higher than what we were paying in the past. Um, standards for cleanliness have changed with COVID-19. We do expect surfaces to be wiped a little better and maybe hand sanitizer to be stocked a little more often and that kind of thing. So the cost is, is going to go up based on our added need. Uh, in the event that the price is much higher than anticipated and, and we would have to, or we would have a shortage of budget, we would just ro roll back our scope. Uh, we would request cleaning once a week rather than twice a week or two times rather than three in those facilities, uh, which we feel would be acceptable in some cases, but we do want to make sure that our facilities are clean and in top-notch condition. So, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Divot, Director Divot, did we change the scope between the, the old contract and the new one, uh, it, is that also part of that increase? No, Madam Chair, Commissioner, uh, they, it was not increased. We actually decreased a little bit of space due to the fact that we reduced our footprint. Um, we're no longer in the assessor building, um, 415. We've, 415 T. Harris, we've reduced the coverage there a little bit. So we've actually reduced the amount of square footage in this bid slightly, uh, but the frequency of cleaning is the same it, from this year to last year, or last year. Be it rather. Understood. I have no further questions. Madam Chair. Commissioner Sada. I just have one question. Would it cost us more if we did it ourselves, if Bernalillo County did it ourselves? Madam Chair, Commissioner, we believe that it would. Um, the additional staff that we would have to spread out throughout the county would be additional vehicles, additional fuel, um, just a much greater impact on our custodial staff. We currently have about 30 custodial staff, and we cover a significant amount of the county with those staff. but we feel that it's it's less expensive for us to contract out these services. Thank you, sir. Madam Chair. Commissioner Benson. I just want to I want to um, share in the frustration of the increase of costs, but I also want to remind everybody of of uh, the increase of costs the uh, mm -hmm. uh, with COVID, and as well as the our legislation. Uh, employers are having to cover uh, so many more benefits than they were before. Minimum wage from three years ago was nine fifty an hour, and now it's twelve dollars an hour. Uh, fuel costs have gone up. Vehicles have gone up. Every commodity price has gone up. So, not that I like seeing a cost like this go up, but um, the small businesses that are uh, bidding for this, they've got to cover their costs and. Uh, and I'm sure most of it's employee costs, which that's what happens. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you. County Manager. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to let you know that was from a contract that we had four years ago. 
So what we did is we reached out to the state to get like a good estimate about what that would cost. And, and so, is that correct, right? And so, so that was from four years ago. From, so that's why there was that dramatic increase. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clarified. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I will move approval of the janitorial service agreement item uh, on the agenda, item 10, C, 1, 2, and 3. Right. And, and that's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much for your work. Item 10D, Information Technology, APIC Custody Protection Project. Warden Jones and... Robert Benavides. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, Robert Benavides, Chief Information Officer for Bernalillo County, I'm joined with uh, Warden Jones, representing MDC. We're coming to you today asking for approval to allow the county manager to procure and sign contracts for a solution called Custody Protect, which we intend to implement at MDC. Um, what the solution provides is a biometric monitor on inmates that are at medical risk, um, collects real-time vital signs, and then alerts uh, corrections personnel and medical personnel of an inmate that's having medical distress, thereby allowing them to respond more quickly and render aid to um, the inmate. We'll stand for any questions you may have. Any questions? Commissioner Olivas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I also asked for this item to be pulled. I had a, co a couple of questions about it. Uh, it. It sounds like something that, that offers a, a really promising technological solution to you know, some of the manpower challenges we have at the jail, as well as just the, the general monitoring of, of vital signs and that sort of thing to, to alert us when something's going on. I guess my, my biggest question was uh, about damages to these devices or, or how these devices uh, are, are made and this can obviously be you know depending on individuals and circumstances a, a rough environment and uh, so I'm just kind of wondering about vandalism and damage of these Commissioner Olivivas uh, these are all detention grade products they are made from indestructible for the most part uh, materials that's a hard plastic type uh, still flexible, still bendable, has a non-pickable magnetic lock that goes on it that actually secures them to the detainee so that they can't mess with them. If they do mess with them, it automatically gives us an alert on the system as well. Uh, the whole point of the matter is detox is our most critical time with a large percentage of our population. 80 to 120 inmates every day are on the detox protocols. That is the most important time that we have with these new inmates coming in off the street, as you've seen by the deaths that the facility has suffered in the past. With this actual product, they have installed it at 19 out of 23 jails in New Mexico, and they have had fantastic results and saved many lives uh, from just the sheer amount of time it takes for it to understand that, oh, we got a problem here with this guy's vital signs. The officer has a tablet right there with him at all times. He immediately gets an alert check on this inmate right here. You can go straight to him. Medical gets the same alert in medical. They know to automatically dispatch staff there so that we can try to stop the issue before it spirals out of control. Uh, Madam Chair, Warden Jones, that's that's very helpful to understand the, the construction of those. And, and my next question you already kind of answered was going to be, uh, how is this looking in other facilities and, and you know, how is it working? It sounds like pretty well. I had been researching it for about a month when New Mexico counties reached out to me and said, hey, what kind of technology do you need or what are you looking for? Explain what I was looking for. He gave me these gentlemen right here, Apex Solutions. They're here out of Albuquerque. They're a local company and they work with John who is the founder and creator of the actual company. Uh, they came out, did a demonstration, loved what they had to offer, loved what they had done at other facilities, uh, got the ball rolling, started talking about it. And I think for us in the situation we're in with the population we have coming in, uh, 
addicted to drugs, the problems. They can be doing great for 48 hours, but on hour 49, you know, they kind of fall out. So for us to have an early warning system, I think it will prevent a lot of other issues in the future. And hopefully it's part of that trying to get the uh, addiction, the detox, all those things that we're dealing with. We're wanting to beef that whole program up to try to make it better for all of us to ensure that we can try to save those lives. Because no matter what, it's a human life. Madam Chair, Warden Jones, you're, you're doing great work out there. I'm, I'm really impressed with this solution you're bringing before us and, and even more impressed that it's, it's a local company and, you know, kind of growing from the ground up here. So that's really exciting. And uh, I guess my, my last question would just be, uh, how is this all going to work with the, the new health authority and, and integrating that with, with UNM systems and, and I met work? I met with UNMH, sat down, went through the whole program, showed them all everything about it, and they were ecstatic with it. They couldn't wait to uh, see it in action. We did a demonstration. They're like, that's awesome. We need that. So uh, that's why we continue on with the process because they was really interested in seeing us get it because, again, seconds matter. Really, really great work. I, I fully support this and appreciate you detailing this for us. Yes, sir. Madam Chair. Commissioner Benson. Um, uh, Warden Jones, I want to also, I failed to uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing with UNMH as well earlier. So quickly for that, thank you. Also, uh, this is great. I think uh, it's a great technology and I support it. But also, um, just unrelated to this, but I am going to ask of you and county manager to um, uh, come back with uh, some information on what we can do to, to get... Uh, drug dogs in in the facility. Um, I, I've spoken <laughs> with uh, Madam Chair, or I'm sorry, Madam County Manager about it, and um, it's, uh, it's pretty ancient technology, but it works. <laughs> and so uh, I'd like uh, information on that. Commissioner Benson, I acquired dogs uh, eight weeks ago. Oh, they you. just completed training last week. They still got roughly two to three more uh, months with their handlers of detailed training uh, to get them going and get them fully uh, certified and activated within the facility. But we've brought them in this week for the first time walking around and uh, getting them acclimated to the actual jail. So uh, it was one of the things that I asked Madam County Manager, could I please get some drug dogs? And she was gracious enough to say absolutely. Uh -huh. And then to top it all off, they were actually donated to us, so it saved us all the money that it would have cost the $10,000 for each dog. They actually graciously donated the dogs to us. Fantastic, because we know that drugs are getting into the facility. Yes, sir. And we've got deaths going on all the time, so we, yeah can't let them in and, and dogs are one of the best solutions for that so that's great news warden thank you so much i i wasn't even aware of it thank and thank you uh county manager oh vice chair barbara and then commissioner Casella. oh thank you madam chair gosh to all of you i don't even know all of you i feel almost emotional i hugged you last time i saw you because i want to go <laughs> hug you again i just was so um so worried both about your position through all our history, worried about us not having the capacity to really handle um, the need. And I think this is this is leadership. Thank you, County Manager, for I thank you for your search for finding the warden. And um, I, this is leadership. I right? looking at the problem and instead of denying it or trying to create it as a problem and a liability, you're looking at face on and finding solutions. So I've just. Yay, and thank you, thank you to all of you. And I did have a question, so wow, even more extraordinary to hear that it's already working out of 19 out of the 23 counties. So that means there's no worry about um, anybody being able to deny use of it or say they don't want, that's already ingrained and usable and happening in other places. Yes. Okay. Well, again, my hat's off, thank you, thank you. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Commissioner Casola. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, technology. Uh, my golf watch lets me know if I'm having a heart attack on, on the golf course. Uh, you know, that's just because I'm a terrible golfer. But, uh, you know, so technology is something that we need to start really looking at in the future. And, yeah, look, 
you know, he called dogs old school. Uh, dogs uh, protect my yard. Uh, I always have German Shepherds, you know. Uh, and I deal with no crime whatsoever. No one breaks into my yard. Nobody comes to my yard. You know, sometimes it's good old, you know, good old stuff works. Uh, and so I'm, I'm glad that that's being uh, put in, into play because dogs are good and they'll do the job, right? Uh, but thank you for moving us into the future here, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I will move approval of item 10D on the agenda, uh, Information Technology APIC Custody Protection Second. Project. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Ward. Thank you. Thank you all very much for the support. Item 11, discussion items, county manager, behavioral health initiative, and Department of Behavioral Health Services quarterly updates. Uh, Senior Manager Pam Acosta and Chief Perez to present. Good evening, Madam Chair, Commissioners. So we are back before you with an update for both DBHS and the behavioral health initiative. So we've been busy. Um, we're going to cover the era, the, the time period between January 2023 and March of 2023. So in total, we had 2,601 uh, admittance to our ONA service, which you all remember, that's the newest um, addition to services that we provide at the CARES campus, um, allows individuals to come in for the 23 hours and 59 minutes, and then with the hopes of getting into a longer term detox bed and further service. So, so 2,601 there. Of those 2,601, we estimate about 622 of them were what we refer to as unique clients or frequent uh, uh, service, uh, frequent, what is it? Frequent utilizers. Frequent utilizers, there we go. I always get the terminology wrong. So that's just interesting and another thing that we are really doing a better job of trying to capture how many times they're cycling back through. Um, in our actual detox facility, we had 854 admittance and of those we anticipate about 504 were uh, frequent. Um, in our SAC, which is our longer term uh, six month program, we had 12 admittance in there uh, during this period. For our Mariposa program, which is our pregnant women with addiction, we had three admittance and we're starting to now see those numbers start to gradually come back up and we did just recently uh, enter into a new agreement or a renew the agreement with UNMH in the hopes that we get uh, some better services for the, the women that are experiencing addiction and pregnant at the same time. So we're looking to see those numbers start to um, increase in what we're able to provide service for. And then out at the jail, we had 180 clients in the ATP service that's provided there. Uh, lastly, in our CSU, which is the Crisis Stabilization Mental Health Referral, we had 36 admits there, and of those 36, 35 of them were frequent. So um, we're seeing a, a definite return back of individuals who come in in some form of crisis and are referred to our facility. We're seeing them come back to the facility for a second and maybe even third time. So interesting numbers there. And lastly, our living room, which was uh, just again recently uh, dedicated to Adan. We had 303 guests there, um, 164 or at least about 54% were guests who had already visited the, the living room prior. So it's doing exactly what we wanted it to do. We have people feeling comfortable enough to come back in or they're receiving some type of service there that they feel good about and they want to continue to receive it. So all really good things going up. Um, so now we get to the other side of the house, which is the turnaways. So for the, the period that we're looking at, January through March, we had only 160 turnaways, which is a vastly... Uh, improved number, and we're associating that a lot to what we're doing on the ONA um, area. But again, 160 turnaways of those, 12 of them were referred to other services or other resources. We didn't have what was needed for those particular individuals, so we referred them out to other resources. Um, 65 of them were picked up by the West Side Shuttle. So working together with the city to, you know, if we, we didn't have the capacity to take them in, but we made sure that someone else was able to. So we had 65 that went to the West Side Shelter. 83 of them were not provided services um, at our facility. And unfortunately, there was no West Side Shuttle running at the time for those, those 83. Um, and I will note that out of approximately 160 of these individuals that were turned away, 
13 of them did not meet the criteria, the medical criteria for entrance into, into our facility. The others were turned away because of our, our census. Um, it's still the, the capacity and due to the staffing. So we are seeing an uptick in staffing, but we're still not to that 100% level where we can accept almost anyone who comes to the door. But it is, it is getting better week by week. And the outlook overall for the CARE Campus I think is positive, and we are starting to see some some really good things starting to take take shape there, just in time for the new leadership, as you all just approved through the through the budget tonight. So, hopefully, I'm able to pass a, a very healthy care campus off to the new leadership, and I'll turn it over to Pam for the behavioral health side. Thank you, Chief Pettis. Appreciate Thank your you. work, right. Madam, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I'll give you the update on BHI. Um, I thought I'd start off with our budget and our contracts. Uh, currently, we are ma now managing 60 contracts in five targeted areas, evaluation, community supports, housing, and prevention, intervention, and harm reduction. Um, several of our one-time funding and also some of our recurring contracts have expired, and those contracts are actually um, part of the multi-award, so they're up for renewal and in negotiations. Specifically, our um, adverse childhood experiences contracts are up for renewal. <clears throat> our current budget allocations are as follows. 22 million in reoccurring, 59.5, actually scratch that, 60 million now after tonight's approval in one-time funding, and 6.7 million in pending or upcoming contracts. Um, and um, an update on the RFP is a long-awaited small provider um, RFP will be published this coming Sunday. Uh, reference number will be 51-23-JM. And the school mobile health clinic RFP will be published the first weekend of May. And the next steps for both are to establish the RFP review panels, which will consist of BHI staff members and BHI subcommittee members. Um, and then I wanted to end with um, a couple of program updates. Um, the Tiny Home Village, which are two programs that BHI manages right now. We currently have 17 homes filled and are interviewing two new individuals this week and one next week. Um, we thought that we would reach full capacity by this month and we were on track. However, and um, also thankfully, um, five individuals have moved into permanent housing. Um, we have two individuals who were awarded permanent housing vouchers and they'll be leaving us soon. Um, some have indicated as quickly as next week. Um, so to permanently house 25% or more of our villagers in a two-month time frame um, is really significant and it demonstrates that the Tiny Home Village is doing what it's supposed to be doing as a transitional living program. Um, and recently, the BHI Housing Subcommittee <clears throat> publicly commended the um, Bernalillo County for its achievements and the operation of the Tiny Home Village. Um, so I just wanted to mention that we were, it was a proud moment for us because they've really held our feet to the fire to make sure that we are spending our money appropriately and that we are managing the clients appropriately. Um, next week, we will be opening up our application window and we'll be reaching out to community providers and individuals who've previously inquired um, so that they can apply. And we, we believe that this is going to keep us busy and get us to capacity. And then finally, with the Tiny Homes Village, one more thing that we've done, we've partnered with one of our BHI providers, the Albuquerque Center for Hope and Recovery, to provide groups on site. And then we're also utilizing one of our other facilities, which is a living room model in Tijeras. And we're taking, transporting the, the villagers there for groups uh, to give them an outing, give them something to do, and Tijeras is really beautiful. So we're maximizing that space. Um, my next program is the Resource Reentry Center. Uh, we are finally, after many, many years, open 24-7. Um, I'm very excited for that. Uh, <clears throat> when we were open for just uh, five days out of the week for 24 hours, we had 29 clients spend the night. Since we've opened to 24-7, which was recently, um, we had 28 spend the night, and we anticipate this number is going to continue to grow now that we're open, and then also as the word gets out at MDC. Um, March has been the busiest month since the pandemic hit in 2020, and our RC experienced 1,124 clients come through, um, and that was a total of 145 transports. Um, our engagement rates are up. Engage, engagement rates in one or more service, so that could be a sandwich, uh, using our phones, or connecting with the case manager, currently sits at 83%. 
When we first began in 2016, uh, or 2018, we were at a 16% engagement rate. It was really low. So 83 is really good. And of that total of people who remain there, of that 83%, 70% um, engaged with the case manager, which is really significant. Um, we've jumped from 30% over the last year and a half to now 70% engagement rate with the case management case manager. Um, Swing shift continues to see the largest volume of releases at 56%, followed by day shift at 39%. And right now, just because we recently started to be open 24-7, we're tracking it and it's sitting at 5%. We anticipate that these numbers are going to change uh, now that we're open 24-7. Um, and then RRC has established two partnerships, um, one with the district court, and they're working together to... Um, uh, have their uh, out-of-custody competency evaluations conducted at the R RRC. We had our first client come through on the 18th. We feel that this is a good partnership because after they conduct the competency evaluation, they can meet with a case manager and, and they're offered those support services. Sometimes those interviews can trigger somebody and, and bring them into a mental health crisis and at least they're in a safe spot and we can, we can help navigate that. <clears throat> the second partnership is with the opt-in diversion program, which is the opioid prevention intervention court. Uh, it's, it's very new. It's in its, its infancy, um, but we've been partnering with them, and the partnership will include diverting individuals who identify that they have a substance use, an opioid addiction, and give them the opportunity to engage in services. Uh, once they engage in services, the courts will process a release, and then we get them connected to either the care campus for services or another um, medicated assistant treatment provider or, or, or a OUD, um, I should say. Um, that, that partnership also has uh, LOPD, the DA's office, and MDC as supports for that program. Um, and then finally, something upcoming is um, the long-awaited, and Commissioner Quesada, I know you mentioned the opioid settlement funds. We continue to work on a comprehensive budget to present to you. Um, and we are seeking guidance from the Addictions Treatment and Advisory Board, as well as our subcommittee on inter uh, prevention, intervention, and harm reduction. Um, there was an exhibit that was attached with that, um, the, the opioid settlement money, and so it does give us some guidelines on what we can spend the money, and so we're, we're really just parceling through that and taking their advice. I stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Acosta. Any questions for the Chief or Ms. Acosta? Vice Chair Barbola. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chief Perez. And thank you so much, Senior Manager Pam Acosta. So much information. I'm also thankful for you all to ask for these regular updates. I think um, just having them in quarterly helps to not like. Um, but I, I just I, I just want to thank for all these numbers for the new, I think you called it AOP, the the new program that is helping us to not have to turn away so much folks. I know, you know, for a total of three months, 160 still sounds a lot, but I know from the numbers before, it's like two thirds of the way down. So I just, that is progress. I'm, I'm very thankful for that. I'm just also thankful for the transparency in numbers. Like let's just name the things that are happening, where they're going, where we're missing. And so we can continue to um, shift and make adjustments as needed. So I am just, yeah, all of these things. I, I'd love to see the mariposa, and thank you for saying that um, you're working to make sure we're addressing that. I'd love to see that number come up. We know there's a lot of women out there and possibly even inside our own hotels and um, or the city's hotels, whatever. But I'm just, yeah, this is amazing. I, thank you. I know, I've, um, I know I'm often the one that has the things to say, so I just, I just want to appreciate all the work. I'm sure all the work of the staff that... Um, is is holding out all these um, all these great advancements, um, and to the behavioral health side as well. Um, so great to hear about that. I, oh, I guess I wanted to point to that. Um, right, I, I really appreciate you, Chief Pettis, also saying that. Right, when um, that 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 folks actually coming back to the living room is a good thing, right? Like we don't we know that folks that addiction. Um, 
is a lifelong journey, a recovery and re, re, recovery from addictions, a lifelong journey. And so if folks know that they have this safe place, it isn't going to be judgmental, isn't going to um, just turn them away on face, right, that they can return to when they might be in those stressful times or facing things, that they have a resource in us. So oh, I can't say enough. And then, So Madam Vice Chair, I will add just something to that. we got to be really careful how good uh, the food is that we offer in the mornings. Yeah. At the living room, we've got two individuals that have made it now their routine the last month to come in every morning just to enjoy the, the coffee and whatever snacks we have in there. So again, it's just a little, little humor to it. But it, it is doing exactly what it was meant to do. It is a safe environment where they can come in and, and it's like going to the donut store for them, but instead they come to the living room where there's someone there who's experienced what they've experienced or what they are currently experiencing. So it's working. Yeah, and that's what we've learned, right, together over these years that even when we house people, um, that sometimes can be isolating for somebody that's um, struggling with addiction or in recovery. Um, so having a space to go, I'll help get those donuts there, whatever the snacks are, if that helps keeping them coming back to a, a much needed resource. So thank you. And I'm sure Commissioner Casada has so much to say to school-based health centers, but I believe in them too. And I just want to um, think that all of this is um, is hopeful and, and just such great outlook. Thank you. Commissioner Olivos. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Senior Manager Costa, Chief Perez. Um, you know, when I first came onto the commission here, we we talked about, you know, our our hope to to really take behavioral health from good to great, and this is exactly what we're talking about: the progress at the tiny home village. You know, from the doldrums of the days when we had two people in there, and you know, even that was a struggle to keep people at that low rate and, and now we're at, at almost, I mean, it's not as though we're full, but but we're empty because the program is working so well, or we're not empty, but we're not full because of the program working and getting people housed, getting people services. Uh, I was actually at Pope Joy Hall the other night and I ran into one of our, I'm not sure that the name for, for this position, but one of our uh, staff from the tiny home village who was there with the villagers uh, at, at Pope Joy Hall. I, I just thought that was a, a, a beautiful thing that, that, you know, this is about getting folks re-engaged in, in their community, in our community, uh, and, and treating them as community members as, as they are, as, as equals. And, and so I just thought that was really great. And, you know, this is just a testament to the fact that, that that's true and, and this is a, a success. And with the resource recovery uh, Center, again, to, to reiterate Commissioner Barboa's point of how grateful I am that, you know, you brought the data and at first you said 83% engaged and that could mean they got a sandwich or they got a case manager and I was going to ask the question of, well, how many talked to the case manager? And so I really appreciate that you brought that because all those services are important, but obviously that's sort of the, the gateway service of, of trying to connect people to resources to, to get them housed, get them Medicaid, get them back in, in their medication assisted treatment, whatever that might be. So uh, really just want to commend you for your work and, and making these programs even better. And Chief Perez, ditto the, the work that's happening at the CARES campus, the report we see last, last uh, commission meeting uh, on, on some of the data there. And, and it just seems like these are just, you know, incrementally getting better. And so kudos to, to the team here and of course to our county manager. Just looking forward to kind of how this will grow and you know, what's next. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sure. Benson. Yeah, yes. thank you. Um, well done. Uh, in, in terms of providing behavioral health services and solutions, uh, it's working. So it's fantastic. Keep it up. I did have a question about the tiny home villages. Now, first, I, I'm thrilled to hear the permanent housing that is being achieved. Um, but the the occupancy is, is still about where it was last report. Um, which is still below 50%. And it's been such an investment of the counties and such a, uh, continues to be such a uh, financial investment. Um, and I've suggested um, handing it over to a, a nonprofit, right, or, or other solutions so that it's, so that is, it, it reaches the, the vision that um, Commissioner O'Malley had when, when she first proposed the idea. Are there, I would like if we could get up to, you know, 90% capacity or 80% capacity like we are in the other areas, then um, I would be satisfied. But are, are there any um, 
actions that you're taking to achieve that at the same level of, of the everything else that you're just kicking butt in? Yes. Uh, Madam Chair and Commissioner Benson, um, so yes, there is plans, as I mentioned, we are going to be opening up our application window. Um, currently, we were running off of our wait list, which was 100 and I believe it was 120 applications. Um, and going down that list, and some people either found permanent housing or they were no longer interested, they found somewhere else to stay, or they just, their numbers had changed. So we feel by opening up this application period or this application window that we're going to get new, fresh people that we are ready to contact immediately and get them housed in. <clears throat> I have to mention and address your comment, Commissioner Benson. When I first took over <clears throat> previously, the um, Tiny Homes Village was being managed by other entities. And since we've taken over, we have increased the number of people who are housed and have enhanced the program to where we are getting people rehoused. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that that speaks volumes. Um, the training that we're providing to the team, the, um, the, we have a current contractor right now that we're really holding them to the fire to create some transition plans and provide the case management. We have a van that we take people to and from of appointments and so I think that that has really mattered in what we do um, we have regular meetings with the, with the villagers to get feedback from them on what we can improve on so those are just some of the ways that we're making improvements and, and listening to them as to what their needs are um, in addition we are promoting the tiny homes village to all of our providers um, giving presentations including national presentations to uh, I think uh, Pinal County, and I might be pronouncing this wrong, Yavapé, um, and then there's a, a, a Santa Fe County, and then one in Oklahoma that want to replicate what we have going, so they've asked us how we're doing it, so we're providing that guidance as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> um, I guess my, my one, couple comments, number one, you know, the tiny... Uh, you know, all, all the services that we're offering, it's like building a business, you know, nothing's successful right away. You, nothing happens overnight. You don't open a business and, you know, within two months it's successful. Uh, we live in a culture, especially here in, in Bernalillo County, that we got to trust you. You got to build trust with these communities and these people. Uh, and if you don't build trust, they ain't going to come. So obviously you're doing that work. You're building trust. It'll, it'll, it'll get there. You just got to keep, you got to keep the business open. You got to keep the doors open. And so that will happen. Um, I'm super excited about the mobile school, uh, school based health centers. And I'm hoping that, you know, before I leave that that's its own department, right? Within your, with, within, within your purview, right? That, that we that it has its own department that we continue to keep growing those wraparound services and that we figure a way to tap in to so, some more money from the state uh, to back us up on that, you know, I mean, they dipped into the permanent fund because we all believe in early childhood education, but we also have to know that, you know, adverse uh, childhood experiences um, are something that, you know, at a, at a young age that we have to address and, and we do not at this point because we don't have the capacity. So I'm hoping that this is the beginning. Of, uh, of us getting on a really great path to really making a difference in our community. So thank you. I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait to drive around in one and, and, and go to a school and, you know, and just see how it, how it functions and how it works. I'm super excited. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, I had one more thing I wanted to make sure to mention just about the Resource Reentry Center. I think the opportunity to partner with strong partnerships is already showing um, that success, right? And I, I just would love, like, I think that's the, I always say that the county is so strong in our courts, corrections, and our uh, sort of that side of the work. Um, and, I, and I think that, you know, doing the same kind of partnerships, as you mentioned, with providers, those building those relationships for things like the Tiny Home Village and our CARES campus. I just think we're, I'm grateful for that you're, that those partnerships, I think it just means that then there's more activity, more life in the space. And it means that people that it's, it's you know, we know it's a buzz, right? That people are like, oh, I could get my thing there. I could talk to the district court there. You should do it. And those are the ways that we, you know, build that um, reputation and come back to the space. So just, I just want to make sure I didn't forget to say that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. We really Thank appreciate you. your Thank work. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Madam Chair. Mr. Excel. Can I appoint a privilege? Um, I, I, you know, I, we're about to end this meeting. It's been a long meeting. I'm sorry to do this, but I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't do this. I want, I want to thank um, county manager, all the deputy county managers, all the staff, uh, all the staff at the community centers in my district for such an amazing South Valley Pride Day. Um, we had 5,000 people. We had tons of people. We had, you know, music from musicians from the South Valley. We had artists there. Uh, we had an awesome parade with a lot of people. Um, this community event is really hard to beat. Um, you know, we've grown it, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and and I push to grow it, and I and I know I'm a pain every time every year that I do it. But the staff at Bernalillo County has stepped up every year and has helped me grow this bigger and bigger and bigger every year. Uh, next year is my last uh, South Valley Pride Day, and um, you know we're, we're I'm, I'm going to go out with a bang. And so, but but I just want to thank everybody. Uh, all of you for, you know, I want to thank my, uh, you know, Shamar, uh, I'm going to give her a special props, you know, Shamar really worked hard and made things happen. I want to thank uh, Margarita, my assistant, and, and, and Isabella, my, my, in, my intern, um, you know, uh, Enrico for, you know, his staff supporting uh, everything that I do. Uh, and I know it's a big event. It's a big pain. Yeah, but, uh, but the South Valley people love you for it. They appreciate you for it. And I just wanted to publicly thank you so much for making me look good because that's very hard to do. Thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Casada. I'm sure it won't be your last Valley Pride Day, right? You'll be coming. Uh, we'll hang out. Yeah. <laughs> okay, with that, uh, the announcement of the next commission meeting, Tuesday, May 9th, 2023, there will be a zoning meeting at 3 p.m. at the Ken Sanchez Commission Chambers. Tuesday, May 9th, 2023, the uh, BCC administrative meeting at 5 p.m., also in these chambers. And if there is no other business, this is, meeting is adjourned. Yay!